Hello and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for keeping us till the third and last day of the GAID uh, Annual Congress. It's always said that desserts are left to the end. And in the end of this Congress, we are presenting a special uh, session about two fascinating fields in endocrinology, namely osteoporosis and menopause. So this symposium is consisting of uh, four lectures that will be delivered to you by experts in the field and eminent speakers. Uh, and at the end, you can keep your question and answers in the Q&A uh, box, and they will be addressed to the speakers at the last uh, session, which will be for discussion. I'm also honored to tell you that this session will be chaired by Dr. Ferial Saber, a consultant endocrinologist from Bahrain. And I will be co-chairing with her, Dr. Nadia Lali, uh, consultant endocrinologist from Kuwait and uh, president of the Kuwait Osteoporosis Society. The first lecture of uh, this uh, symposium will be delivered by Dr. Riyad Suleimani, who is a professor of medicine and consultant endocrinologist from King Saud University, uh, King Saud, uh, University in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. He has obtained his medical degree in 1977, and seven years later, he obtained the American Board of Internal Medicine uh, degree. Uh, later, he had become a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons in Canada, and he also he held a certificate of special competence in endocrinology from the same place. Currently, Professor Suleimani is the president of the Saudi Osteoporosis Society and the past president of the Pan-Arab Osteoporosis Society, and he used to be also a past member of the IOF, the International Osteoporosis Foundation. Uh, there are more than 80 publications by Dr. Soleimani in the special scientific and academic interest he has, which are thyroid, osteoporosis, and diabetes. So without any further delay, I would like to welcome Dr. Soleimani to present the first lecture, which will be metabolic uh, renal, meta renal bone disorders. Please, Dr. Soleimani, the screen is yours. Assalamu alaikum, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, introduction. My topic will be on renal bone uh, disorders. And this is a very important topic, not only for nephrologists, but for people who are interested in uh, metabolic uh, bone disease. But as you can imagine, it's a very complex uh, topic and it's extremely difficult to cover in 20 or 25 minutes. So I'm going to concentrate mainly on the clinical aspects of the disease, the recognition and the uh, management. Now, as uh, we all uh, do, we are going to uh, start by outlining the presentation, uh, the definition of uh, renal bone disorders, its pathogenesis, its types, management, and hopefully at the end take home messages that are useful for us uh, in our clinical practice. Uh, metabolic bone disorders are uh, really uh, um, an important and frequent complications of chronic uh, kidney disease and uh, uh, they have abnormalities in bone and mineral metabolism. And uh, the purpose of these uh, adaptive mechanisms is to maintain the calcium and phosphorus homeostasis. But during all of these uh, pathways, um, uh, derangements happen in different areas uh, in bone and vasculature. And that's what uh, uh, makes metabolic bone disorder a very important aspect of managing patients with chronic kidney disease. Uh, we in, in medical school have been told the, the, the term renal osteodystrophy to describe these uh, changes that happen in bone in patients with chronic kidney disease. Nowadays, the term renal osteodystrophy is uh, exclusively used to describe the histopathological changes that occur in bone in patients with uh, chronic kidney disease. Now, the clinical and biochemical aspects and all of the other aspects now are uh, 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 made under the title CKD, Mineral and Bone uh, Disorder. And this is really the new name which describes more specifically the mineral and calcific vascular abnormalities which occur in these patients. So a combination of the following abnormalities is what we commonly see in these people with uh, uh, renal bone disorders. Basically, abnormalities in calcium, phosphorus, parathyroid hormone, or vitamin D metabolism, 
changes in bone tin over uh, uh, mineralization of bone matrix, volume linear growth or strength, and extraskeletal calcification. Now, before we go further, this is the uh, important uh, classification uh, uh, or nomenclature that was uh, 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 produced by Kedigo uh, to describe the different stages, if you like, uh, uh, of uh, um, chronic kidney disease, starting from G1, uh, uh, which is the normal kidney function with normal GFR, to G5, in which we are talking about very low uh, GFR uh, uh, rates uh, below 15 or 10 milliliter per minute. And this is, of course, the stage when people start talking about uh, dialysis. So I think it is important when you deal with somebody with chronic kidney disease, you would like to know at what stage or at what category your patient belongs. So I think this is very important to have uh, uh, um, uh, 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 this information from the very beginning when you deal with these individuals. Now, these are the key players in, uh, in, in, in this renal bone disease, the phosphate, uh, 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 the calcium, the fibroblast uh, 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 growth factor 23, uh, the calcitriol, and of course, the parathyroid hormone. Now, hyperphosphatemia uh, and phosphate retention occurs quite early in the disease. And uh, uh, it is uh, generally believed to be a very important initial trigger of bone disorder. And it occurs because of a decline in the GFR with a reduced filter phosphate load. And the phosphate retention promotes hyperparathyroidism by inducing hypocalcemia by decreasing the 125-dihydroxyvitamin uh, D3, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, in part due to an increase in the uh, formation of F F G, uh, uh, F23 and by inducing uh, PTH gene expression. So hyperphosphatemia, which occurs early, is, is bad for bone. And as I said, it's a, an initial trigger of bone disease in these individuals. And indeed, in animal models with uremia, when animals were fed a high phosphorus diet, as you can see, there is an increase in the weight due to the increased hyperplasia of the parathyroid glands in these animal rats with uremia who have been fed a high phosphorus diet. Whereas if you compare these animals with the animals who were fed low phosphorus diet, you can see that there is a stability of the uh, hyperplasia of the parathyroid gland. So one of the, of course, uh, techniques that nephrologists use all the time is to reduce dietary uh, phosphorus intake and to use materials uh, to increase parathyroid hormone uh, production. And indeed, as the plasma calcitriol falls uh, uh, below even 60 milliliter per minute, you get an increase in the uh, um, <clears throat> FGF23 and also later by functioning arena, there is a reduction in the 125 dihydroxyvitamin D3. This, of course, will cause decreased calcium intestinal absorption. It will cause calcium release from bone uh, is being reduced as well. And there is a direct reduction in the number of vitamin D uh, receptors. There is also a good evidence that there is decreased responsiveness to calcitriol in these um, individuals. Hypocalcemia, of course, is a very uh, natural occurrence uh, uh, in patients with chronic kidney disease. And this is related to hyperphosphatemia, the low calcitriol, and the PTH resistance. Now, the hypocalcemia in these individuals is sensed uh, by the calcium uh, um, receptors, the calcium synthesis receptor. And um, hypocalcemia, as you all know, is a very important, potent stimulus for parathyroid hormone uh, production. There is also good evidence that there is skeletal resistance to parathyroid hormone in these individuals. So really to wrap up what we have been saying in the last 10 minutes, the basic abnormalities which cause secondary hyperparathyroidism in patients with CKD include the following, phosphate retention, decreased production of calcitriol, hypocalcemia, increased production of FGF23, and reduced expression of all of these important receptors and skeletal resistance 
to the action of parathyroid hormone. All of these will contribute uh, to the occurrence of secondary and even later tertiary hyperparathyroidism uh, in these individuals. And uh, this really figure also summarizes uh, uh, what we have been saying in the last 10, 11 minutes. Now, in terms of parathyroid hormone, if you were to uh, look at the spectrum of renal osteodystrophy, you can see that there are two important extremes here. The first one is the high turnover bone disease, uh, which is related to increased bone turnover, uh, which manifests clinically and radiologically uh, by osteitis fibrosa. Uh, and on the other hand, you have a low bone uh, uh, turnover, uh, which manifests with two important clinical presentations, namely a dynamic bone disease and osteomalacia. And the level of the parathyroid hormone might give you a clue to what is going on in the patient's bones. And you can see here that uh, in peritoneal dialysis, for example, you see more cases of adynamic bone disease as compared to hemodialysis. So there are some important factors that contribute uh, to the type of um, renal osteodystrophy that we see in these uh, individuals. Now, as I said, the low bone in over metabolic bone disease manifests with either osteomalacia or a dynamic bone disease. It is commonly observed in diabetic patients who are on dialysis. And here you have a low rate of bone uh, formation. Uh, the most common form of renal osteodystrophy, which is being seen nowadays, particularly in elderly diabetic patients, is this form. And here, and here you really have an oversuppression of parathyroid hormone, which may be related to uh, excessive use of calcitriol uh, in these individuals. Now, these are very important laboratory markers that might give you uh, uh, a clue that you are dealing with this entity. The parathyroid hormone levels tend to be low. Uh, the, uh, the alkaline phosphatase, or perhaps more importantly, the bone-specific alkaline phosphatase is low. Many people feel that this is a very important parameter, the bone-specific alkaline phosphatase. If you see a patient with high bone uh, uh, alka uh, alkaline phosphatase, it is very unlikely that you are dealing with a patient with a dynamic bone disease. So I think this is very useful. Unfortunately, it is not done routinely uh, in, hospital, uh, in hospital labs. Uh, also, these people have uh, a notorious tendency to develop hypercalcemia, even with smaller doses of calcium uh, carbonate. <clears throat> uh, adynamic bone disease is uh, uh, make bone also uh, susceptible to fragility fractures. Osteomalacia uh, is related to reduced bone uh, uh, mineralization, and it is a form of low bone thin over disease. The high bone tin over disease is really related to a very uh, active and uh, a high tin over in these individuals, which is basically the result of hyperparathyroidism with the formation of the osteitis fibrosa, which is clearly classically seen uh, in, in, in bones. And uh, if you were to do the histopathology, you will find the fibrous tissue intermingled with the rest of the bone structures. Now, over the years, there has been uh, a change in the trend of the type of renal osteodystrophy that we see in people with CKD. You can see here that a dynamic bone disease over the years seems to take the upper hand. And I, said, I think this is related to the overzealous use of calcitriol and calcium supplements in these, uh, uh, in these um, individuals, uh, uh, particularly uh, elderly diabetic uh, patients. So really, in summary, if you have a, 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 an under suppression of parathyroid hormone, you get a, 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 a high ten over bone disease. And if you have over suppression, you get the, the low uh, ten over bone disease. The clinical presentation of renal bone disease is interesting in that many patients may not seem to be symptomatic. And when they develop symptoms, uh, uh, they may not be very specific. And they might be in the form of bony aches, and uh, pains. And of course, we see this more particularly in patients with hyperparathyroidism, the proximal muscle weakness, especially with vitamin D deficiency and the predisposition, the predisposition to fractures. 
extra skeletal calcification, blood vessel calcification, and of course, uh, in these individuals, there is an increased all cause uh, uh, CVS uh, mortality. Mortality is increased in these individuals, especially if they start to develop extra skeletal calcification and blood vessel calcification. The bone disease in CKD is more classically seen in patients on dialysis, but also seen in the majority of patients with stages three to five. In dialysis patients, if they're 40, there is a relative risk of pig fracture, which is 80 fold that of age and six match controls. Whereas patients with stage four, for example, CKD, they have four fold higher risk of hip fractures than the general population. So these are some uh, important uh, uh, um, uh, statistics about fragility fractures in CKD. And as you can see, when you compare people with a relatively low uh, EGFR compared to uh, GFRs of 60 or so, you can see that <clears throat> there is a five times higher risk of fracture in these, um, in these um, individuals. Uh, the incidence of hip fracture is also increased. Uh, the hip fracture related mortality is also increased when you compare people with lower EEGFR, for example, below 45 milliliter per minute. Can we assist the bone disease in these people or not? Uh, DEXA scan, of course, is the tool that we use all the time to measure bone mineral density. And if a patient has got an EGFR of uh, 60 milliliter uh, per minute, and uh, uh, the low uh, and the bone mineral density is equal or uh, less than minus 2.5, or there is a fragility fracture, here it's important to distinguish this osteoporosis. Uh, as based on the T-score from, uh, for example, a postmenopausal osteoporosis. And postmenopausal osteoporosis, for example, the alkaline phosphate tends to be normal. The parathyroid hormone tends to, to be normal, which is not usually the case in patients with uh, 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 mineral and bone disease. Um, uh, can you use DEXA scan for people uh, with age of Arab, uh, above 30? Um, um, it is, uh, it is possible to use DEXA scan in these um, individuals. If the GFR is very low, it may be uh, uh, obtained in selected patients, especially those who have fragility fracture <coughs> and no evidence of CKD MBD, i.e. Uh, uh, they have normal PTH, normal calcium, normal phosphorus and alkaline uh, phosphatase. So this is really the new KDGO uh, uh, recommendation that the DEXA scan to assist <clears throat> fracture risk, it can be used uh, in people from G1, G2, and in G3 to G5, if you think that the BMD is going to uh, help you to make a decision about treatment. The DEXA scan, of course, as we uh, all know, has limitations, but the two most important limitations, as we know, uh, 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 are the following. DEXA scan will give you an idea about the quantity of bone in gram per centimeter squared, not the bone quality, not the microarchitecture. And this, by the way, applies to CKD and non-CKD patients. Now, the second limitation of DEXA scan is that it does not correlate with bone histometry, uh, i.e. it does not give you a uh, discrimination about the exact type uh, of bone disease, whether it's normal, high or low bone thin over bone disease. And therefore that will make life difficult for you to, uh, to, to, to reach to a, a clear cut therapeutic uh, decision. Now, this is a very important slide. I think this is perhaps the most important slide in the presentation. Here you can see that all of these patients seem to have the same bone mineral density of 0 0.75 gram per cent uh, centimeter square. But this patient is osteoporotic, this patient has osteomalacia, this patient has dynamic bone disease, and this patient has secondary hyperparathyroidism. So by, low, by bone mineral density, they all seem to have the same bone mineral density. However, uh, uh, as you can see, uh, the uh, pathology here is different in these different individuals. So not all that shines is really gold. Uh, and therefore, uh, uh, when you look at the bone mineral density, you have to take it in the context of the clinical uh, and the uh, radiological and laboratory findings in these people. Can we use FRAX? 
<coughs> yes, it is possible to use FRAX, as we know, it's the tool that we use to know the 10-year probability of a hip fracture or a major uh, uh, fragility fracture. And in this study, it was possible for the FRAX, whether with or without BMD, to predict major osteoporotic fractures in people with lower CKD. Bone biopsy is used in these in, uh, in, uh, indications. Uh, it is not done, done routinely except in specialized uh, clinics. And really, um, uh, this transiliac bone biopsy uh, tool is used whenever you have, an, you don't have a very good idea of what type <coughs> of bone disease is going on or if you have unexplained fractures, or you have refractory hypercalcemia, or suspicion of osteomalacia, or an atypical response to standard treatments for elevated PTH, or a progressive decrease in BMD. However, it's invasive and requires special equipment, and it cannot predict the fracture risk uh, at all. How do we treat uh, renal bone disease? Uh, uh, these are the uh, new KEDIGO guidelines. If the patient is in stage uh, G1 or G2 with osteoporosis or high risk of a fracture, the management here uh, is recommended as for the general population. So we have no problem with this category of, uh, of patients. Now in patients with CKD, uh, G3A uh, to G3B, <clears throat> and if the PTH is in the normal range, Again, uh, the treatment recommendation uh, uh, are used as for the general population. We use the same WHO criteria to diagnose uh, osteoporosis and to treat osteoporosis in these individuals. Now, this is the group that gives uh, us uh, difficulties all the time. And these are the people who have good biochemical abnormalities of CKD, MBD. When I say biochemical abnormalities, I mean they have high phosphorus, high pH, and so on. And uh, quite often, it, uh, it may be uh, necessary to do a bone uh, biopsy in these people. Uh, it's, uh, if you really would like to know whether there is room for treatment in these people uh, or not. Um, if the patient has a history of fragility fracture without evidence of renal osteodystrophy, the patient is a candidate for osteoporosis uh, treatment. If the GFR is between 15 and 30, with fragility fracture and without evidence of renal osteodystrophy, the pharmacologic therapy for osteoporosis may be uh, indicated. If the estimated uh, GFR is more than 30 and there is no evidence of CKD and BD, uh, 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 these people can be treated with bisphosphonates as patients without uh, CKD. In lower uh, uh, GFR rates, let us say below 30 or so, most people will say that bisphosphonates are generally not recommended. And here, you, have, you might need to consider denizumab. But watch for hypocalcemia whenever you use, you use denizumab uh, in these um, individuals. Uh, so uh, patients with evidence of CKDMD, and especially if the GFR is very low, generally speaking, the anti-resorptive osteoporosis drugs uh, should not be uh, administered in these people you can concentrate on controlling secondary and tertiary hyperparathyroidism. You prevent over <coughs> suppression <coughs> of parathyroid hormone and you treat the acidosis and vitamin D deficiency. So this is really a summary uh, uh, of uh, how you manage these people. Uh, you have to find out the stage of the renal uh, disease in these individuals and depending on the presence or absence of biochemical abnormalities, of CKD, MBD, namely hyperphosphatemia and PTH, you can uh, make your decisions about the treatment. <clears throat> so really the management goals here is to intervene early and you monitor all these important players that are playing different roles in uh, renal bone disorders, mainly calcium, phosphorus, parathyroid hormone and vitamin D. You try to maintain calcium, phosphorus and 25 hydroxyvitamin D levels as normal as possible. You prevent and treat hyperparathyroidism by dietary phosphate restriction, phosphate binders, calcium supplementation, and in patients with advanced CKD uh, and hypercalcemia, uh, uh, PTH is, is, is very high, 
uh, you may uh, uh, you may need uh, to, to to consider the use of calcium mimetic, but watch for hypocalcemia, and uh, watch for oversuppression of bone. So these are two important issues that need to be considered whenever you use calcium calcium mimetics. And I think it won't hurt to have the uh, cooperation and, opini and opinion of our colleague uh, nephrologist in these um, individuals. So in, con in conclusion, and uh, these are the take home message or messages, if you like, uh, the first thing that we would like to emphasize here is that uh, these <coughs> disorders are commonly seen. The fragility fractures are increased in these individuals and it may be related to high or low bone in over disease. You can assess the bone integrity by doing a DEXA scan and you can uh, utilize the fracts in these uh, individuals. And in the absence of biochemical abnormalities, you can treat uh, the osteoporosis as in the general uh, population. It is uh, only tricky when you have uh, abnormalities uh, in the biochemical uh, parameters that you really have to judge uh, uh, the, the treatment indication uh, uh, as, is it, uh, as it is related to possible reversibility or progression <coughs> of the disease. I think before starting the treatment, it is important to know the stage of renal impairment and the type of bone thin over in your patient as much as you can. <coughs> and you can <coughs> utilize the, the lab uh, tests, uh, the, uh, most importantly, the parathyroid hormone, the alkaline phosphatase. And I think in generally speaking, particularly in these individuals, I think you have to know <clears throat> the trend of the changes that occur in these individuals, not the, uh, uh, the lab findings in one day. You have to see whether the changes are persistent, they are uh, improving, they are deteriorating, uh, uh, is the calcium uh, rising or is it going down and so on. Uh, uh, consider bone biopsy if the situation uh, is not uh, very uh, clear. Uh, so with that, I would like to thank you for listening to this uh, presentation and I thank the moderators um, as well. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Dr. Riyad, for this uh, very interesting uh, subject. And now we would like to introduce Professor uh, B. Hughes, who uh, going, who gave a lecture uh, earlier today. And Dr. Astalah, he introduced her, but uh, Dr. Uh, B. Hughes uh, has graduated from Tuft University and um, she uh, trained in, at Tuft. And she's an endocrine fellowship at Harvard. She led researches in the Bone Metabolism Laboratory at the USDA, Human Nutrition Research Center on Aging, and is a professor of medicine at Tufts. She has a lot of researches, more than 425, and book chapters as well as uh, reviews, uh, peer-reviewed journal articles. Uh, please, uh, Professor Hughes, all the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, it's uh, nice to be back. And uh, we're gonna address uh, the topic of correcting vitamin D deficiency and uh, some of the do's and don'ts related to that. This uh, follows on from the presentation I gave earlier today. Uh, again, my disclosures. Um, and uh, so that we're all using the same uh, language here, I'd like to uh, just indicate to you that when I'm talking about deficient uh, love, uh, vitamin, in vitamin D, I mean a 25 hydroxy D level under 12 nanograms per mil inadequate or insufficient uh, 12 to 20, and sufficient is 20 and higher. And these are the definitions derived uh, by the Institute of Medicine, which has in the last year been renamed to the National Academy of Medicine, NAM. Um, so, uh, we're going to look, uh, we know that vitamin D in food sources is limited, sun exposure is important, and we know that supplements are often required. So let's focus on uh, several aspects of, uh, to consider when supplementing. 
We need to access the need, determine the dose, uh, decide on the dose frequency, and when to take a supplement during the day, specifically in relation to meals. So in terms of need, uh, I don't think uh, you need to be convinced uh, that uh, the insufficiency and deficiency are rather common uh, in uh, the, the Middle East. This was a survey uh, led by uh, El Haj Fulahan uh, of, of evidence showing uh, the levels color coded by range. And so much uh, in the white areas, the ones where there were no data, doesn't mean they were not low. Uh, it just couldn't be documented. So this uh, applies to both adults on the left and children on the right. So uh, now let's go to the business of um, looking at the dose, but we're gonna come at it a little indirectly. I'm gonna focus on uh, doses and the evidence uh, related to bone health fractures uh, and, and so forth. So I think a very high quality meta-analysis by Yao published in 2019, looked at uh, the effect of a large number of uh, trials uh, on fracture risk. And in this particular uh, picture, we are looking at uh, trials that use supplementation with vitamin D alone the upper panel shows uh, findings for any fracture, and uh, the, uh, that was not significant. Uh, it, it was leaning toward favoring control of the placebo group. Uh, and hip fractures, same thing, not significant, but almost demonstrating uh, more falls with the supplementation. The other aspect of this same meta-analysis was to look at the trials that use vitamin D plus calcium and their effect on any fracture and hip fractures. Upper panel, we see that these trials, see, let's see, one, six of them that were identified that reported any fracture showed a risk reduction of 6% significant uh, in fractures hip fracture risk reduction was 16% and, uh, and quite significant in the combination uh, treatment. So uh, it, if this is where we need to be, let's just focus next on the uh, vitamin D levels used in these calcium and D trials to see if we can uh, address what dose we have evidence for being beneficial. And if you look highlighted in the green rectangle that all of these trials except one used 800 units a day. And the trial that used a different dose was the Women's Health Initiative using 400 units a day, which we've seen um, is uh, probably not uh, that effective. But overall, uh, the evidence for improve, uh, uh, lower fracture risk resides in 800 units a day. And the trials that combined with calcium uh, were the older trials and they did not um, you test higher doses and they didn't test D alone. So I think uh, that gives us uh, uh, solid footing for uh, recommending 800 units of, of, of vitamin D uh, together with adequate calcium intake. Uh, some individuals would need more, uh, those with osteoporosis, no sun exposure, uh, fat malabsorption and conditions that you're familiar with. Um, it's useful should you need to go to higher doses to have an idea of what dose to to um, uh, recommend. And so here are uh, average increments in 25 hydroxy D for given uh, increases in D dosage. If you add one microgram, 40 units, you get a one nanomole 
per liter increase in the circulating level. If you add 100 units, you get about a nanogram. That's a rule of thumb. It applies generally, but not specifically to individual patients, but it's a good starting point. Um, to, in dealing with people with very high BMI, you know you're gonna uh, need a bigger dose because they'll have a lower starting level. And Van Gronen uh, gave us a nice formula that is shown here that you can use to make an estimate uh, that is uh, a weight-based estimate for uh, the dose needed in these individual patients. Um, we know uh, that color of skin, the amount of melanin in skin uh, will influence the amount of, of skin synthesis of vitamin D. Uh, and it, the darker the skin, the more it absorbs the ultraviolet B rays of the sun that would, if they uh, weren't absorbed by melanin, uh, uh, would promote vitamin D production. So it's, uh, I took this picture from um, data in a book by Mike Hollick, who did a lot of the uh, sunlight, uh, sunbox or uh, artificial experiments. And he, he uh, this one was actually done in these two locations, Boston at 40 degrees uh, north latitude and Miami, which is 26 degrees north. I'd like to point out that the latitude of Dubai is 25, very close to that of Miami. So you can use that as an approximation of what you uh, get. So it, with the lightest skin, uh, well, or even you don't make D in at our latitude in the winter. It, the angle of the sun is so wide that it, these rays needed don't reach Earth's surface. But uh, in June and August, with the lightest skin in Boston, you would need um, two to eight minutes. With the darker skin, you need much more, more than 10 times uh, longer. Um, uh, exposure to get adequate uh, production. And in Miami, which is most relevant to you, in the light-skinned uh, uh, people will uh, need 10 to 15 minutes in the winter uh, and one to five minutes in the summer um, and uh, need longer in the winter, but they can still produce uh, D. And we're talking about um, time of day around the middle of the day. If you, the further you get out from the middle of the day, uh, the fewer of these rays will actually um, reach the surface of Earth. And we're talking about minutes with hands, face, and arms exposed. This gives you a general idea. Many people will wear sunscreens, which completely block um, if they're high uh, uh, number sun sunscreens, they will block the UVB rays entirely. Um, the question comes up, is it uh, D2 or D3? Does it matter? And the answer is no, it does not matter. Uh, you would need a little more D2 because you don't achieve quite as high a level with D2 as you do with the same dose of D3, but that's an easy adjustment to make. So whatever is available and uh, uh, meets uh, general clinical practice quality standards uh, is fine. Now we get to an interesting issue, and this is where uh, some of the newer uh, points come into play. You know the classic picture here. You can give the same ultimate uh, cumulative dose on a daily, weekly, or monthly basis and achieve similar levels of 25 hydroxy D. Um, at the infrequent or less frequent monthly dosing, you get a more variability shown by those little circles and squares and so uh, stars above, but uh, the mean will be fairly similar. And this has encouraged people to recommend doses on a monthly or even less frequent basis because uh, on the premise that compliance would be better and that the patients really, uh, would, would like it and prefer that. But uh, now here's the rub. Uh, the question is, uh, do these high doses, uh, which we know raise 25 hydroxy D levels, 
result in greater amounts of the active metabolite 125-dihydroxy-D. Uh, let's uh, take a look at a meta-analysis of 23 randomized control trials that looked at the effect of vitamin D supplementation on circulating FGF23 levels. And in the upper, uh, the red uh, rectangle, we will see that if you're giving activated forms of D, you get a very high uh, uh, increase, big increase in FGF23. If you give doses over 2000 units daily in 13 trials, um, they found higher levels of, of FGF23 than was seen in uh, supplementation with lower doses of D. And that uh, was a P uh, of, for interaction there that was highly significant. So these big do infrequent doses are going to uh, trigger uh, the release of FGF23 from bone. Now, is that good news or bad news? Well, uh, in an, an uh, elegant uh, study in mice, FGF downregulates one alpha hydroxylase and upregulates 24 hydroxylase. So basically, um, the premise here is that high doses, uh, doses of D uh, daily or boluses may not lead to the higher 125, uh, uh, the active uh, 125D levels. So if we follow the little picture here, we start with high dose uh, D increases FGF uh, 23 coming from bone. Look at the little red arrow on the kidney uh, and it's blocking the uh, one alpha hydroxylase to produce the active compound. Not only that, it's increasing, shown by the green arrow, the lower green arrow, it's increasing the metabolism of the current 125 to the inactive metabolite. Um, uh, so it is, uh, basically having the net effect, high doses have the net effect of increasing the circulating 25-hydroxy-D, but uh, lowering uh, the circulating levels of uh, the active compound. So um, what does this mean? It means that the, endo the elegant vitamin D endocrine system reads this infrequent or bolus or high dosing daily uh, as a signal that of threat against toxicity. And so it steps into action and makes sure that the active metabolite uh, is either is both pro less produced and more rapidly metabolized to 12425, which is inactive. So we're measuring the wrong thing in essence when we are using these doses. So, and we know, uh, uh, here's another uh, example, one of the earlies that very high bolus dosing uh, was causing more falls and fractures. As I showed you uh, uh, in my earlier presentation, uh, weekly dosing or monthly dosing with 2000 units per day equivalent, that is 60,000 units, uh, was increasing falls. So we may be actually creating a vitamin D deficient situation with this uh, aggressive dosing. And the last uh, area I wanted to focus on uh, is the question of, does it matter when during the day uh, you take the vitamin D. And um, 
we're going to look at some absorption uh, 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 procedure. The, the classical procedure or uh, method of measuring vitamin D absorption is shown here by Cliff Lowe back uh, published in 1985. And uh, it was carried out as follows. You would uh, treat with, uh, give people a single uh, dose of 50,000 units of D3 and you would uh, track their circulating 25-hydroxy D levels um, or and their parent, actually it's the parent vitamin D levels that were achieved. And it was, you could see um, in the picture on the left, people with malabsorption where the cases A, B, and C, and G, D, and E on the, the bottom flat line markers, the normals would achieve their peak level of parent vitamin D after consuming this big dose uh, around 12 hours. And so that, be, and it would decline thereafter. That became the standard of measurement. We, uh, a few years ago, uh, made a modification of the method that we think gives a more accurate reading. We would, um, give uh, an oral dose of D3, but that was spiked with deuterated D3. And we could assay by LCMS MS, uh, baseline and follow up parent D levels um, and get the deuterated to undeuterated ratio so we could uh, correct uh, for problems that would, could take place over that 12 hour period when you're waiting for the peak level, such things as individuals uh, being exposed to sunlight during that time or inadvertently taking vitamin D uh, in a pill or in a food item or something that would distort the absorption. So uh, once, uh, once we put that method into application and looked at whether this fat soluble vitamin, vitamin D3, uh, would be influenced by uh, fasting conditions or non-fasting, and moreover, whether the amount of fat in the meal, and since it's, uh, the fat gives you the, the, the physiologic basis for absorbing D, um, D travels in the cells up to the uh, uh, surface of the uh, uh, GI tract for absorption and so forth. And what we found, we found that uh, fast that uh, that fasting uh, was not good compared with a meal containing ten percent fat. We then did this as second experiment, which in which we wanted to look at a more typical uh, amount of dietary fat. Uh, use that as typical in the U.S. thirty percent of calories as fat in the meal. And uh, we saw that if you took a typical meal uh, with fat in it, uh, you had 30% higher absorption of vitamin D than if you took D under fasting conditions or under conditions of a fat-free meal. So since most, unfortunately, uh, meals in the US contain fat, um, uh, we can just generalize that here to uh, take it take it with a meal as opposed to in the fasting state. I would like to conclude uh, with several observations here. Um, vitamin D supplementation in modest doses when combined with an adequate calcium intake lowers fracture risk in adults with insufficient and deficient 25 hydroxy D levels. That's the uh, crux of all of this, all of these trials. 800 units of D taken daily with adequate calcium is sufficient for the general population. Um, others, uh, uh, including uh, those with malabsorption, osteoporosis, obesity, dark skin may need more. As you know, the Endocrine Society recommends achieving a level of um, uh, 30 nanograms per mil uh, to be adequate. I could comment that the Endocrine Society has a new uh, group of experts put together 
to review the endocrine society's guidelines. And I think we'll be hearing uh, updated guidelines from them perhaps in the next year. The recent null mega trials do not alter the importance of vitamin D together with calcium uh, in, uh, and in meeting these daily requirements, particularly in regions of uh, widespread vitamin D insufficiency, such as the Middle East. High daily doses and bolus doses of vitamin D do not guarantee an adequate level of 125 dihydroxy D. Now you may be asking, well, should we be measuring 125 in everyone? Absolutely not. Just avoid the high dosing and avoid the uh, bolus dosing. And I think uh, that will uh, take care of this problem. Um, uh, and they, uh, the, the safety of these high doses hasn't been, uh, is in question, uh, not in question anymore. It, it increases risk of falls in those at high risk. Um, and the safety in younger adults is uncertain, um, but why use high daily, do daily dosing when we know that it is going to impair ultimately the achieved level of the active metabolite? So I just think high dosing and infrequent dosing should be out of the picture. Uh, and if you're recommending a daily supplement of 800 uh, or so units of vitamin D, uh, you can get uh, much uh, a better absorption if you take it with a meal. So that's my take on the do's and don'ts at this point. It's a constantly changing picture. So uh, we're trying to keep up with this massive amount of literature that we're seeing. And um, it is eternally interesting to follow. Thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you very much, Prof. And I'm thinking this was a very enlightening lecture and probably a practice changing uh, lecture. I'm sure it will be inviting a lot of questions at the end of the sessions. So let's move now to the third lecture in our uh, symposium today, which is about the Gulf osteoporosis guidelines. And uh, it will be presented by Dr. Yusuf Al Saleh. One of the most active endocrinologists in the region is Dr. Yusuf Al Saleh, who is currently an associate professor of medicine and endocrinology at the King Saud Abdul Aziz University in uh, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. He obtained his um, RCB from London, UK in 1994. And two years later, he also obtained the Arab Board of Internal Medicine. He is a, then after that, he joined a fellowship program of endocrinology and diabetes in the University of California, San Diego, USA. And he obtained the fellowship in the 1998. On top of that, he also had a diploma of healthcare and hospital uh, management from the American University of Cairo in June 2010. At some part of his career, he was the in charge of all the residency program in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia as he was the president of the Scientific Council of Medicine. I still recall early in 2019 when Dr. Yusuf Al Saleh called all the osteoporosis society in the, in the GCC to have a meeting there in Riyadh and to come up with this guideline. So I'm glad that today it will be presented in our uh, Congress. Dr. Yusuf, please. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Um, al my pleasure and honor to join you in the Gulf Association of Endocrinology and Diabetes Annual uh, Virtual Congress 2021. And I hope everybody is enjoying the experience of uh, our uh, Congress uh, and uh, achieve academic uh, progress. Uh, so my task is to talk about the diagnosis and management of uh, osteoporosis in postmenopausal women in Gulf Cooperation Council uh, countries. Uh, and this is a consensus report that I'm going to talk about in the following 25 minutes or so. These are my disclosures. And this is a small synopsis that a consensus platform is divided, uh, is provided by the experts of the Gulf Cooperation Council uh, countries, uh, respective osteoporosis societies, in which specific uh, guidelines can be developed further 
for regional use in the assessment and treatment of postmenopausal women at risk of fractures due to, due to osteoporosis. This is um, a gathering that ended up with this, inshallah, beautiful and useful publication in a very well-respected journal, Archives of Osteoporosis, one of the journals of the International Osteoporosis Foundation, uh, and this was published in 2020, um, actually to the second part of, the, of 2020, and titled Diagnosis and Management of Osteoporosis in Postmenopausal Women in Gulf Cooperation Council countries consensus statement of the GCC countries osteoporosis societies under the auspices of the European Society for Clinical and Economic Aspects of Osteoporosis and Osteoarthritis, the ASQ. We developed a task force that included um, at the chair of biomarkers of chronic diseases in King Saud University in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, in cooperation or collaboration with the Saudi Osteoporosis Society uh, where regional experts from uh, respected uh, GCC osteoporosis societies were hosted and we gathered together uh, including an advisor from the uh, European Society for the Clinical and Economic Aspects of Osteoporosis and Osteoarthritis. The closed door assembly of experts commenced in February 15 and 16, uh, 2019 in Riyadh and every osteoporosis society in the Gulf region was represented by a representative. There was um, many presentations laid down by experts, of the, uh, by the experts. So we divided the main topics of the consensus report between each member and each member had to come and present uh, his findings, his literature review on that specific aspect. Uh, we ended up with um, our medical writer writing a draft recommendation. And this went to almost um, a year of uh, discussion, uh, back and forth revisions, which uh, reached more than 15 revisions till we end up with the publication in its final form. The diagnosis uh, section uh, says that made on the basis of T-score of bone mineral density as assessed through DEXA, of femoral neck, spine, or distal radius. You have to have two sites. A value of less than minus 2.5 standard deviation is considered to be osteoporosis. Therapy is indicated if the risk of major osteoporotic fracture above what we are going to discuss later, upper intervention threshold using a country-specific FRAX model or a surrogate model uh, if that country has no specific model. If a patient has a reading above an intervention threshold with known value of measured BMD, then that patient needs treatment. The, we, we stated that other diagnostic modalities like heel ultrasound can be used for screening. They lack standardization and confirmatory DEXA for abnormal findings is needed. So whenever you do heel ultrasound for screening, if it's abnormal, you go for DEXA, but you cannot use it for diagnosis of osteoporosis. You can diagnose osteoporosis by the presence of low trauma, fragility fracture, especially uh, hip spine, but also distal radius and proximal humerus are considered as osteoporotic fractures. A question that we laid in the consensus report is BMD enough? BMD is ex expressed as a gradient of risk, relative risk per standard deviation decrease in bone mineral density, predicts an increased risk of fracture that is comparable across the population. But the absolute risk of hip fracture may vary by up to 20 fold between countries in the world. If you use BMD alone, it has suboptimal sensitivity and specificity. And the ability to predict fr fracture risk is improved when BMD is combined with clinical risk factor. And this is what came up with uh, FRAX, the fracture risk assessment methodology that we use. These are the risk factors that are when added to BMD, increase the prediction of fractures in people, age, the six, low bone mineral mass, bone body mass index, history of fragility fracture, family history of hip fractures, history of chronic steroid use, the presence of rheumatoid arthritis, arthritis, premature menopause, less than 45 years. This is the definition. The presence of diabetes is not included right now in the FRAX, but it's planned to be in the future. And we have a way to compensate uh, for the absence of diabetes and the FRAX scoring. 
current smoking, alcohol abuse, and incidental finding of height loss more than four centimeter on thoracic kyphosis. They are, these are not mentioned in the flags. But in population studies, all of these correlate very well with the risk of fracture. The use of bone markers of formation is still not available widely in our countries. The serum collagen type 1N probeptide and uh, resorption, the CTX, serum C terminal cross linking, telopeptide of type 1 collagen, have value in predicting fracture risk and follow up of treatment response. Fracture risk assessment, country specific model, as we mentioned, I mentioned, uh, should be used. Currently, there are FRAX models for five countries in the Middle East. We recommend the use either of Kuwait or Abu Dhabi versions uh, for GCC countries. We belong to the same ethnic background and uh, for countries in the region who do not have FRAX model to use one of these two. Kuwait data looks robust with three years of data collection. The paper from Kuwait is between 2009, 2012, and the collection was quite good. We have to understand the limitation of FRAX because there are certain things that are not included in the FRAX. Uh, one of the things is it depends on adequacy of epidemiological information. Uh, limited countries models available in GCC, just Kuwait and Abu Dhabi, and does not accommodate all known risk factors. The false biochemical markers, quanti quantitative ultrasound, and as we mentioned, diabetes uh, is not there, and also lack details on some risk factors. So the dose response of steroid, it just says glucocorticoid do you use yes or no but it does not take into consideration the dose of steroid we know that the higher the dose the more is the risk of developing osteoporosis and fractures smoking also the dose response of smoking those who uh, smoke two or three bags is different from a couple of cigarettes uh, a day uh, the number of fractures so it says previous history of fracture yes or no but we know the more the uh, presence of fractures in a certain person, the higher the risk. And that's nothing took, uh, taken in consideration in the FRAX mo model that we have now. Uh, the model is most relevant for untreated patients and does not replace clinical judgment. Fracture risk assessment, FRAX can be calculated uh, without DEXA at baseline. So as we're going to see in subsequent slides, you can use FRAX to even decide who are the patient that needs to have DEXA scanning. Low risk patient, when you do FRAX, if the patient is in the low risk category, uh, should be followed uh, with advice on lifestyle uh, uh, changes, uh, while high risk patient should be treated. Patient in the intermediate risk, then you do BMD and you re-measure the FRAX. So treat those with high FRAX score based on the individual country's intervention threshold after you do the BMD for intermediate pe people. So the case finding study uh, strategy has been adopted by NOF, the National Supports Foundation, uh, and, and, and their guidelines in 2008. So you look at clinical risk factors, and based on the clinical risk factors, you do the FRAX. So ask the question, the nine risk factors we talked about, and if the FRAX reading is high, you go ahead for treatment without a BMD. If it's low, follow up and advice on lifestyle changes and adequate calcium, vitamin D, sun exposure, avoidance of um, nutrients which increase uh, bone loss. When the FRAX score is intermediate, then these are the patients that you go for bone mineral density. And then after you get your FRAX reading, you enter them uh, in the FRAX module. So you do refrax, high risk treat, low risk follow up. Trabecular bone score, and this is what we mentioned in the consensus report, be served as an additional um, information to BMD measurement and FRAX, so it helps in uh, increasing the diagnostic accuracy of BMD and FRAX. FRAX readment should ideally take into consideration exposure, exposure to glucocorticoids. The data on lumbar spine, and this is a limitation of FRAX, so it, you have to use the, the nicofemur density, while we know that some patients have significant reduction in lumbar spine t-score rather than or bone mineral content rather than the hip and that's not included in the frax calculation the use of trabecular bone score hip axis length falls history immigration and diabetes status are these these are some of the limitation of frax and not included in the current score we hope that with time it's, it improves uh, its uh, uh, 
you know, point that it takes into consideration. Uh, vertebral fracture assessment, VFA, should be done for all patients whenever possible. And this can be done on the DEXA scan machine by inserting a software that will tell you, tell you uh, the VFA and it measures or tells you the picture of the spine, um, uh, shows those vertebrae with collapses, and the patient does not need to go for lateral spine X-ray. History of more than four centimeter height loss or kyphosis, recent or current long-term oral steroid therapy, or a BMD to score less than minus 2.5 are additional indications to do uh, VFA. Therapy decision, and this is um, adopted from the European consensus or European guidelines on osteoporosis that published in 2019 by John Canis and his group. And um, characterization and treatment pathways of fracture risk by FRAX, uh, major osteoporotic fracture probability. So you FRAX the patient and you put the score. If there is a patient lies in this red zone, this is very high risk patient and needs to be treated. Green zone that he is safe, low risk, and does not need treatment. Um, and the question is here in the orange area. These are the patient in the intermediate zone. And these are the people that you need to do BMD for them and refrax them. So within the orange zone, um, we need to decide the intervention threshold for uh, giving these patient treatment. And uh, when you do frax, uh, look at this X signal. Uh, if the patient is below the intervention threshold, this is a low risk. This is after doing the BMD and refraxing the patient. So measure BMD. If it's in green, low risk, you don't do anything. If it's in the red, treat. If the, it's in the orange and above this intervention threshold line, then this is a high risk patient that needs treatment. So he's an intermediate risk group in the orange area, but he's above the intervention threshold. And for these people, they are not in the red threshold, which is clearly indicated for therapy. Uh, they are in, uh, in the intermediate zone above the intervention threshold and need to be treated. If they are below the intervention threshold, then they do not need to be treated. So this is a simple explanation of this figure. This is again uh, taken from Kuwait osteoporosis guidelines. This is the intervention threshold for uh, patient in the orange, in the intermediate zone. So the upper assessment threshold will calculated by multiplying one by two times the intervention threshold. Uh, so this is the upper assessment here, this line, and this is the lower assessment threshold. Above in the red area, consider treatment, green, no treatment. In the intermediate zone, you do BMD and you refrax the patient. If they are above the intervention threshold for Kuwait, then you treat that these people. If they are below, you don't treat them. We know that uh, the annual incidence of hip fractures in women varies across countries. We lie here in the bottom of this curve. So Saudi Arabia and many other Gulf regions, uh, Gulf countries or uh, Middle East countries are here in this region. We are considered as low uh, risk for um, uh, fractures. And as you can see here in, the, in this green Gulf countries um, uh, in this area, the low. And these are the countries with an incidence less than 100 per 100,000 uh, population. Now, once you get your FRAX uh, model for your country, you have to try to uh, set your intervention uh, uh, model. So there are three models that are available. So fixed threshold model, this is used in the state, the National Super Process Foundation, uh, publication 2014 by Felicia Cosman. The 10-year probability of a fracture, so it's a fixed threshold. Once the patient is at or above this threshold, he needs treatment or she needs treatment. 10-year probability of a major supported fracture, more than 20%. 10-year probability of hip fracture, more than 3%. This is a fixed threshold readings and the patient needs to be treated. Um, while in Gulf countries, this is the curves for uh, Kuwait, Abu Dhabi, and if you look at the 10-year um, probability of a major fracture in Kuwaitis, this is called a moving threshold. So the threshold goes higher with advancement in age. This is the age at the horizontal line. And this is the intervention threshold, low threshold at younger people, and higher threshold when people get elder. And this is to avoid over-treating elderly people with osteoporosis therapy. So this is called a moving threshold. Uh, uh, this is a model uh, seen here or shown here for 
uh, some of um, uh, Kuwaiti people. The third technique or third methodology is called as hybrid model. And this is again demonstrated in Kuwaitis. Uh, so this is the fixed threshold up to 70 years of age. And then the use of a moving threshold according to age. The higher the age, the higher is the intervention threshold reading for 10 year probability of fractures. Uh, and this is um, what is recommended in probably in our region because we have low risk of fractures, especially in younger people. And to avoid over treating uh, our population, then probably this is the best model to be used. Just a word about Saudi Frax. This is not mentioned in the consensus report, but to shed some light on this uh, aspect. This is the curve for Kuwait, Abu Dhabi, and Saudi Arabia in blue. We are more or less similar to Kuwait and Abu Dhabi, and this is expected minor differences um, uh, between uh, us, especially with people above 60 years of age. Um, uh, and uh, the Saudi frax is going to come very soon. Um, so in Kuwait, age-based frax intervention threshold were able to identify women with higher frax probability versus fixed T-score thresholds, uh, particularly among the elderly. This is the paper for Kuwaiti frax. Uh, and this is uh, Helena Johansson from uh, WHO, uh, the John Canis group, uh, with our colleagues, uh, from uh, Kuwait who are involved in the um, put of the FRAX, uh, Kuwait FRAX. So this is again mentioned in the consensus report, age-dependent FRAX-based intervention threshold can be used in countries with moderate to high fracture risk, such as Oman and Kuwait, in identifying women with higher fracture risk. Um, and in countries with low incidence, such as the kingdom, the hybrid threshold use of both fixed and age-dependent may be more suitable as it avoids patients with low risk for fracture and targets only high risk elderly people. We put in the consensus report advices on lifestyle and dietary vitamin, uh, dietary measures like uh, calcium and vitamin D intakes, uh, the advice for weight bearing. I want to remind you that we have these um, um, consensus reports also. This is the Saudi vitamin D uh, consensus report published in 2017. And furthermore, we published the GCC countries uh, uh, consensus summary statement on vitamin D diagnosis and management of vitamin D deficiency in the Gulf countries. And this is again published in 2020 by experts from the Gulf region. So please have a look on these and it summarizes very nicely uh, the um, method to diagnose and treat uh, vitamin D deficiencies in our countries. We put in the consensus report for osteoporosis this graphic um, um, representation of um, many aspects of the consensus report like diagnosis, fracture risk assessment, the advices on lifestyle. We adopted or modified this with permission from uh, Professor Canis uh, statement or uh, guidelines in 2019, the European guidelines, and we modify them to, uh, to suit the GCC countries. So it's not exactly the European um, guidelines, it, suit, it goes for figures related to uh, GCC countries. We also included this pharmacological management table in which uh, we describe various agents uh, to treat osteoporosis and mentioning statement on each of these agents, um, uh, when to use them. And this is the alternate uh, first line therapy and this is alternate therapy. So um, this is a, a nice table that we thought it's going to be very helpful for healthcare practitioners in their daily practice. We also included this table, which is again adapted from John Canis group. Um, and this is mentioning the effect of um, treatment, various treatment available in the Gulf region on uh, vertebral fractures and non-vertebral fractures collectively. So where is the agent, uh, these agents work at these sites? A statement about anabolic steribratide is preferentially recommended for patients at high risk of fracture like those in the immediate post-fracture period and those with a fracture and extremely low bone mineral density. A statement on system of care, the utility of age-dependent frax thresholds in population screening approach has been recently validated as feasible, effective, and health economically viable. So whenever possible, any postmenopausal women and elder men do frax without doing a BMD and see where this patient lies 
uh, low risk advice on lifestyle, uh, high risk, you can treat them, intermediate risk, you do beyond mineral density. And that is an um, excellent method to save our resources and selecting who are the patients that needs to have a BMD. We recommend uh, coordinator based fracture liaison services uh, to be developed in the region. Recently, in the Saudi Osteoporosis Society, we have combined meetings with the International, Sport, International Osteoporosis Foundation to set the um, FLS centers in, in the kingdom. We know that there are several centers in the GCC countries, but we are looking for more. We think that we are lagging behind um, from instituting this valuable and extremely important uh, service. The consensus report has been endorsed by the Saudi Osteoporosis Society, uh, who kindly uh, hosted the physical meeting in Riyadh in 2019. Uh, it is endorsed by Kuwait Osteoporosis Society, the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, the Gulf chapter, uh, which is currently transferred to the Gulf Association of Endocrinology uh, and Diabetes, for which this presentation is made for in its first annual virtual Congress. So GATE is extension of uh, Gulf American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists Gulf Chapter. Emirates Osteoporosis Society, Emirates Diabetes Endocrine Society, Oman Medical Association, Bahrain Osteoporosis Society, and Qatar Osteoporosis Society. Uh, I would like to end my presentation by thanking our dear colleagues, um, Professor Nasr Daghri, the chair of um, the, uh, the Center for uh, biomarker research in King Saud University, the College of Science, and he is also the dean of that college. Uh, Sean Sabiko, who is our medical writer, Thamir Al Isa from Kuwait, Samar Al Imadi from Qatar, Fathia Al Awadi, and uh, Mustafa Al Azizi and Abdul Rahim Al Suhaili from Emirates, Jamila Mukhaimer from Bahrain, Abdullah Al Futaisi, Al Futaisi from uh, Oman, Salim Al Qassabi, uh, Abdullah Al Futaisi and Salim Al Qassabi both from Oman. Professor Riyad Sulmani, the president of the Saudi Osteoporosis Society, and Professor Jani Bridgenster uh, from uh, IOF SQ. Uh, all of them contributed equally to this paper. Um, very thankful for their great support, their excellent uh, expert opinion, uh, their patience on a person like me uh, who uh, made their life miserable during the preparation of this uh, consensus report with uh, hundreds of uh, emails and communications uh, through social media. Uh, but at the end, we came up with a beautiful paper uh, that I call everybody to have a look on it and hope that it's going to be of great help uh, to um, treat, diagnose and treat our patients with uh, osteopenia osteoporosis. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Youssef, for this uh, outstanding uh, presentation, as usual. And now it gives me a great pleasure to introduce one of my dear colleagues, uh, Dr. Huda Azadeen. Dr. Huda Azadeen is a consultant uh, in diabetes and endocrinology, uh, director of academic affairs and healthcare center for diabetes and endocrinology in Abu Dhabi. Uh, Dr. Huda had, uh, she's a fellow uh, in the Royal College of uh, Physicians uh, from London and Edinburgh, as well as a fellow from the uh, American College of Endocrinology. Dr. Huda has held several uh, leading clinical and academic positions in public and private medical facilities in UAE, and has been actively involved in various scientific and professional committees medical education, as well as review for regional peer-reviewed medical journals. The, uh, her main interest is uh, in thyroidology, diabetes, and women's health. And today, she's going to talk to us about postmenopausal syndromes update. Uh, please, Dr. Huda. Thank you very much, Dr. Afriyal, for the kind introduction. Thank you for the uh, organizing committee to um, uh, invite me to speak about uh, menopause. I just wanted to um, inform you that this is a very difficult task to finish all aspects and updates on the matter in a 25, mi 25 minutes, um, but I'll just um, allow me to skip through some of the slides or expand on some uh, as necessary. 
Um, I have no disclosures to make, uh, but I really wanted to emphasize uh, just the brief content of my presentation, starting from the knowledge and attitudes towards menopause, some diagnostic and, and assessment tips, and then I'll go through the management guidelines and end by recommendations. Um, over the past um, uh, decades, the investigators in general have showed a great interest in uh, publishing knowledge attitudes and practices in various health conditions, and menopause is no exception. So basically from um, looking at surveying uh, women's attitudes and, and knowledge as patients or as uh, uh, major public health issues, to healthcare providers' um, knowledge, attitudes, and practices, and also involving the policy makers, which is really outstanding. And in the past uh, 40 years or so, from the 1977 till this year, there has been 780 publications all about knowledge, attitudes, and practices about menopause. And in 2021, we have eight of those already. And to be honest, I mean, we keep on publishing all about those knowledge and attitude surveys, but they all have common conclusion and results, which is gap in knowledge. And not only that, they all have, um, you know, a, a, a clear um, evidence that there are deviation from management guidelines. So what do we do? I mean, as clinicians, let's start from the beginning. So again, we wanted to uh, make sure that everybody share the common grounds, uh, particularly for the menopause. So basically, uh, you all know that menopause is a programmed um, ovarian dysfunction, and it starts from some kind of a trigger, whether it's a genetic factor, environmental or lifestyle or some systemic diseases that act on the hypothalamus, which leads ultimately to an impaired timing of the LH surge, and then ultimately to the uh, decline in the estrogen production and uh, from the ovary, as well as a decrease in ovarian follicular maturation and function. And that happens, as you can see from the, from the figure, directly through uh, the uh, hypothalamus uh, or indirectly or directly now uh, uh, through the, uh, the ova ovarian dysfunction uh, through aging process. So it is a genetically programmed loss of ovarian function and uh, we cannot state a, a woman a a menor a menopausal unless we have at least 12 months of amenorrhea after the final menstrual period reflecting the ovarian follicular depletion, which usually occurs around the mean age of 51. However, that doesn't happen abruptly. There are like a, a sort of a prodrome or a perimenopausal period that expands to about three years prior to the final menstrual period, where people can see, uh, women can see menstrual cycle variability uh, uh, accompanied by low AMH, low inhibin, and low antral follicular count. And from the time of the last menstrual period, the woman usually uh, experiences um, vasomotor symptoms or symptoms uh, of urogenital atrophy that will become later um, in life. And, and to be honest, I mean, we know that it is genetics, we know that there's an uh, ethnicity and environmental factors, but being a diabetologist, we can't really blindfold ourselves uh, about the impact of diabetes and hyperglycemia, even on the viability of ovarian functions. So women uh, who are known to have type 1 diabetes, their menopause starts earlier uh, at an age of 41 as compared with the non-diabetic sisters, for example. And women with type 2 diabetes can have their menopause even earlier than their uh, non-diabetic counterparts. And there has been some suggestion to um, uh, conclude that even the higher level of A1C can actually predict an earlier menopausal state in women. Um, it is really important to exclude some of the common um, scenarios that patients may come with. Uh, for example, a woman around the age of 48 may or may not be menopausal, but could be on some uh, pharmaceutical agents like SSRI or some on alcohol, or they're having some anxiety disorders. So we have to make sure that women are not on, act on, on uh, or having other uh, uh, differential diagnosis for their vasomotor symptoms, for example. 
And, and therefore, to diagnose women in the age above the 45 um, and above, the NICE guidelines, as well as other um, uh, scientific bodies, they actually do not rely on lab um, diagnosis for menopause. So generally, we rely on the clinical picture. So women who are healthy women who are having vasomotor symptoms on irregular periods or probably having more than 12 months of amenorrhea and with the uh, uh, vasomotor symptoms in the hysterectomized woman. We do not depend on the analysis or the assay of inhibin ARB or estradiol or LHFSH unless uh, a woman is actually having a premature ovarian uh, failure uh, prior to the age of 45. Fine, so uh, these symptoms are quite known to um, most uh, women and men. And uh, to be honest, I mean, the representation of, or, or the presentation of various um, uh, symptoms and signs is really depends on the perception of the woman and the geographical uh, and the racial background of those women. So this is a nice um, study that looked at four countries and surveyed 300 menopausal women between the ages of 45 to 55. And you can see a variety of presentation of various uh, symptoms of uh, menopause. So we can say that from the left, so like uh, Lebanese women, they probably, they present with depression. Of course, they have other reasons to be depressed for, but then uh, they have more depression compared to uh, let's say, uh, American women who present mainly with hot flashes and joint pain. And you can just uh, see through the uh, uh, Moroccan women's or Spanish uh, women. So I wish we can just say that we would like to have a, a quick fix for the problem and having just a quick HRT or some sort of a, a, a protein shake that can reverse things out. But it's not that simple, of course. And I just wanted to highlight a few things before I carry on. We, we, women are actually scared and healthcare providers are scared of HRT because of the, uh, uh, their impact on cardiovascular system. But please remember that menopause itself can have a detrimental effect on cardiovascular system, which is governed by the estrogen decline. So from the estrogen decline, it is directly or indirectly can cause endothelial dysfunction through activation of some renin angiotensin system or in increase in the endothelin or indirectly through the increased blood pressure, increased triglycerides or obesity. And they all pull up to an increased risk of ischemic heart disease if this menopausal thing hasn't been corrected. And therefore it just makes sense if I can just replace what is missing then we shouldn't have any cardiovascular issues. But that's just easy to say. But again, it's really important to keep that in mind um, if you want to uh, uh, you know, discard the issue of HRT. Fine. So my role is now to uh, emphasize on new data that has been pu published ever since the 2002 Women Health Initiative um, scared the whole world against uh, HRT. So actually from the post hoc analysis of Women Health Initiative, cardiovascular disease outcomes published in JAMA were more or less reassuring, and we will see that in a bit. Also some of the, um, the KEEP studies that looked at the cognitive, the menopausal symptoms and the sexual functions and how important HRT can be beneficial for those uh, symptoms. The early versus late intervention trial, the elite trial, the Swedish uh, trial, uh, and the Danish osteoporosis uh, study, they're all reassuring. And I'll just go through some of the systematic reviews and meta-analysis that were published over the past couple of years. So the focus of newer studies is mainly on women with a shorter history of menopause. Uh, they've looked at the different age ranges, the beneficial effects of different formulation of estrogen and, and progesterone. So to, be, to begin with, uh, this, this is from the Women Health Initiative, the post hoc analysis. And you can see that they have stratified all the outcomes based on the age ranges between 50 to 50, 59, 60, 69, and 70, 79. And you can see from the p-value here on the relative risk 
of cardiovascular uh, outcome, that none of those have a significant detrimental effect on cardiovascular disease, whether patients are on estrogen, progesterone combination, or in estrogen alone. On the contrary, if you see this bit of uh, a, a sort of a protective um, uh, effect of HRT in women against MI who uh, received um, estrogen alone, of course, they are hysterectomized um, and they are uh, between the ages of 50 to 59. The same study have also looked at whether women who has a pre-existing um, metabolic syndrome would be at a higher risk. Well, yes, this is true. So women, as you can see here, that's having a, an odds ratio of 1.7, if they're having it for the risk of developing um, uh, heart disease, if they're having a pre-existing um, uh, metabolic uh, syndrome. So that's in a way reassuring for women who are just, don't have a metabolic syndrome and they are younger at age of menopause and they're, have, they're starting uh, HRT at a, uh, uh, for a shorter duration. Again, we'll come to that in a bit. Um, let's look a little bit at the stroke trial. So this is a trial that looked at more than 8,800 thousand postmenopausal women in Sweden from the 1987 to 2002. And they were followed up for a mean duration of 14 years. And they've actually looked at the rate of stroke in general or hemorrhagic stroke in women who started the HRT early versus starting HRT late. And they've also looked at different combination of estrogen, progesterone, and different formulation. And the outcome here is not the, uh, the presence or absence of stroke, but then looking at the years free of stroke to the right-hand side or to the left-hand side of that forest plot. And the conclusion from that study is that early initiation of uh, hormonal therapy between zero to five years after menopause onset, as compared to never use, is associated with a decreased risk of stroke or hemorrhagic stroke whereas the late initiation was associated with elevated risk of stroke or hemorrhagic stroke uh, when used the conjugated uh, estrogen progesterone as a single therapy. Further uh, studies, which are the systematic review and the meta-analysis just published this year, they've looked at different outcomes and the use of the HRT from various pooled analyses. So definitely, if you look at the genitourinary, vasomotor and fractures, we have a benefit. But if we look at the cerebrovascular accidents, thrombosis, and cardiovascular diseases, we would have some harm. Uh, the same uh, meta-analysis also looked at the risk uh, and benefits, uh, if ever, from HRT uh, at, for, for different uh, new plasms, like the colorectal cancer, we will have some protective effect. But if we have a breast cancer, there's a, a detrimental effect. They've also looked at the diseases of nervous system like Alzheimer's. Some studies said it is protective. Other studies said that it is uh, harmful. And, and therefore, uh, it is really important to see the overall picture uh, and look at the population that has been studied. This particular one looked at the breast cancer in a, a nested case control study in the UK from the 1998 to 2018. And looking at 33,000 breast cancer women versus control and uh, between the ages of 50 and 78. And they've specifically looked at the recency and duration of use of HRT at different age stratification. And their outcome was that the incident rate of uh, breast cancer in these women. In general, there, in, there has been an increased risk of breast cancer associated with long-term use of estrogen only therapy and the odds ratio is marginal, about 1.1. And if they use the combination estrogen-progesterone, then the odds ratio is, uh, is higher to uh, closer to uh, one, uh, to closer to two. Um, and then the combination treatment associated with the lowest risk was really drew the attention to the combination of a safer progesterone combination, estrogen and the progesterone. So the type of progesterone that has been used is also important in the risk uh, of breast cancer. After that, um, 
I felt that it's really important after viewing all of those, uh, you know, publications and literature. So what would be the ideal approach for menopausal women? So I thought a, a, a woman who had um, uh, menopause within the previous five years from the final menstrual period, we needed to check for the indications and the contraindications um, to use HRT. And also it would be of benefit to calculate the breast cancer risk and calculate the cardiovascular disease risk. And then we can have uh, the option of having either estrogen or estrogen in combination with progesterone based on the uterus. And of course, we would need definitely to discuss with the patient, what is her priority in treatment? Is it for vasomotor, is it genital uterine, the cognition or the bone issues? And so let's talk about these things. Uh, basically, it's important to remind ourselves that the main indication of HRT is really to relieve the uh, menopausal symptoms uh, in general. And it's also, it can be considered in women uh, below 60 um, for, uh, who are having low bone density without the uh, fracture. In terms of contraindications, um, of course, if we have uh, an active breast cancer or active endometrial cancer or an active CVA, active liver disease, we do not use the uh, HRT. And there's more and more uh, publications advocating HRT in patients with a past history of breast or endometrial cancer, which has proved to be completely free of disease. So those are just relative contraindication and not absolute. <clears throat> the list of precautions expand with time because more people are becoming more aware that maybe those who are having protein C, protein S, antithrombin deficiency would be at a higher risk of thromboembolic disorders and one wouldn't really initiate HRT for them. Or women who are having um, diabetes may be at a higher risk of complications based on the metabolic uh, condition uh, for the woman. Uh, moving to the cardiovascular risk, I mean, if you apply the um, American Heart Association 2013 guidelines, that's a straightforward heart risk calculator. You just enter what is there. Unfortunately, the race is either African-American or others. But I mean, this can, I mean, with this group of, uh, uh, of scientists here in this forum, we can still do our own uh, ca risk calculator. And from that perspective, we can say that uh, if we have a 10-year cardiovascular risk of less than 5%, then, and, and the shorter duration of menopause, then HRT would be okay. Whereas if we have the cardiovascular risk is more than 10,000, then it is better to avoid um, a, a hormonal replacement. Likewise, if we do the breast cancer risk assessment tool, we can still categorize the patient as a lower risk or higher risk or even intermediate risk of breast cancer and then work it out accordingly. The vasomotor symptoms, which is the main symptom that, women, that brings women to our attention in general, whether they volunteer and come forward to you or they just get referral uh, from their GP, and most of the time, women with vasomotor, they just think that it's probably thyroid. What well, it's really important to make sure this, uh, this differentiation um, and this is not a thyroid. So, so what, is, what happens in the, the vasomotor symptoms? So there's a sudden episode of intense heat, usually in the face and neck that is really lasting about one to five minutes, which is really triggered by, um, an abnormal thermoregulatory zone in the hypothalamus, which is becoming dysfunctional. And that really occurs in about 60 to 80% of women in their menopausal life. And number one treatment for that would probably be a hormonal treatment, uh, just uh, what is uh, shown here with the KEEPS trial. You can see that the use of estrogen alone or in combination with uh, uh, progesterone would have a, a significant improvement in the hot flashes rate, night sweats and insomnia, but not as much on the irritability rate. Um, if you think about the non-hormonal medications for vasomotor symptoms, we know that the, a lot of those SSRI medications have been tried and the, the one which is FDA approved is paroxetine. It can be efficacious in 60% of women, 
Uh, venlafaxin also has been tried uh, of label uh, um, and also the gabapentin. But you really need to make sure that you really want to put those women on, on these medications or not. Make sure that the woman is aware of the side effects and whether it will help in other non-vasomotor symptoms of their, uh, of their menopause. Now, lately, which I would really like to share with you is the um, identification of the neurokinin-3 receptor inhibitors. So it, this actual neuron, which is the caspeptin neurokinin B uh, dino, dinorphin neuron, this is an important neuron in the hypothalamus that has a role in the GnRH pathway as well as in the thermoregulatory pathway uh, of the body. And what happens is that in the case of menopause where the uh, ovarian estradiol reduces and to some extent the testicular androgens also reduces, there will be of course the negative feedback mechanism to the hypothalamus and that will upregulate the gene for the uh, caspepsin neurokinin uh, neuron and causes hypertrophy of those cells producing those peptides and that will lead to here on the left-hand side, the heat dissipation neuron activation, which will lead indirectly to the sweating and the cutaneous blood vessel dilatation, as well as activation of, of the uh, muscles uh, under the skin, and, the, and uh, which would trigger the uh, shivering and the cutaneous blood vessel vasoconstriction. So what happens is that scientists have identified that receptor that will um, uh, help the binding of those uh, uh, neurons into the heat dissipation uh, cells and block it. So if we can block that pathway and we can block this one, then we wouldn't have the abnormality of the thermoregulatory pathway, uh, you know, mainly in the, vasom in, the, in the menopausal state. And this has already been tested in a phase two trial and uh, led to the publication in The Lancet in 2017. And uh, it says is the neurokinin-3 receptor antagonism as a novel treatment for menopausal hot flashes. And uh, they've actually tested that in uh, Imperial College London, uh, uh, the Stephen Bloom and, and uh, Prague uh, group. And they've actually looked at um, a shorter duration of this uh, medicine in a crossover uh, randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial. And they, so they've, on a small number of women, roughly around 37 women, uh, randomized into either taking the intervention or a placebo. And then after a period of washout, they have uh, swapped the intervention. And you can see on the right-hand side panel, the significant reduction in the frequency of the hot flushes of more than 80% reduction, which is quite significant in the top panel. And uh, in the bottom panel, uh, they've actually looked whether there is an order effect, whether the patients have started the placebo first or started the, the active uh, substance first, they have still showed an 80% reduction in the uh, menopausal, uh, I mean, the vasomotor symptoms in particular. So, to date, there are three molecules that are in the pipeline, which I think is, I mean, the, the phase two trial has been completed, uh, and then we're just waiting for the completion of phase three trial in, in one of, from, from uh, the three of those molecules. So that is really interesting, and uh, that will really help our women alleviate their vasomotor uh, symptoms uh, in general. The second most distressing uh, symptom is the urogenital symptoms, which is mainly the vaginal dryness and itching and stress, incontinence and so forth. And you cannot really uh, get blinded to the actual structural uh, uh, development, structural changes that a woman experiences with the loss of vaginal rugae and elasticity, as well as the a change in the vaginal pH because of the reduction in the lactobacillus bacteria in the genital tract and the change in the pH and the overproduction of other pathogens uh, in, in, the, in the place, uh, creating more uh, UTI and infections. So again, what to do with that? The KEEPS trial showed the beneficial effect of um, the uh, 
estrogen, whether used in conjunction with the progesterone or if it is used in transdermal. So that actually looks a bit um, uh, uh, congested, but you, you can see that uh, the arousal score, the desire score, the lubrication score, orgasm, everything actually improves with any form of estrogen, except for the fact that the sex hormone binding globulin, of course, the, uh, the, the uh, dermatological application of estrogen, the transdermal estrogen will not have that effect, which is really something really, really good, bypassing the liver effect of the oral um, estrogen progesterone uh, metabolism. So other non-hormonal therapies for the uh, urogenital syndrome, uh, the, the use of lubricants and moisturizers, of those maybe the silicone-based ones would be uh, the ones which are recommended. If we wanted to have the more the hormonal therapies that has been actually studied, whether the creams, the, the inserts, the vaginal rings, the use of uh, um, even testosterone uh, creams and so forth. So in general, the, there appears to be safe in terms of risk of venous thromboembolism. There's a no increase in the risk of cardiovascular diseases, the stroke or PE or MI, and no association with the risk of breast cancer. However, estrogen is estrogen. There should be some sort of absorption, and there would be some a contraindication in women with undiagnosed vaginal bleeding or estrogen-dependent neoplasm. Now we come to the main theme of this session, which is bone loss and, uh, and fragility fractures. Excuse me. <coughs> Um, to be honest, I mean, it's really important to know the effect of estrogen on the bone health in general. So I'm sure that you would agree with me that estrogen is a main modulator for osteoclasts, osteoblasts, and osteocytes. With an ultimately, there is a, a reduced bone resorption, maintenance of bone formation, and reduction in activation of bone remodeling. And if we don't have the estrogen, which what will happen? So if we don't have that, we will have more of the increased um, um, osteoporotic or uh, bone resorption markers and more of the osteoclast activation will, will increase the bone resorption and uh, low bone masses and the uh, loss of the bone architecture. Of course, this is one part of it and you do not really um, focus on menopause and forget that those women are aging. So with aging, we will have the deficiency of vitamin D, the reduced physical activity, and the sarcopenia. And those are play together with the uh, deficiency of estrogen, estra, uh, estrogen in order to promote more of the low bone mass and low trauma fractures. And therefore, if you wanted to talk about the therapies of osteoporosis, uh, I'm sure that you've heard from earlier uh, presenters the role of the different drugs that can be used in uh, postmenopausal osteoporosis. You just need to be aware of what would be the benefit of those, whether we are, I'm targeting vertebral fracture, non-vertebral fracture, or hip fracture, and for how long you would be needing to uh, use those medications for. But if you wanted to talk about the prevention of osteoporosis, then there is the estrogen whether uh, orally or uh, transdermally, estrogen would be really important uh, uh, category in the prevention of osteoporosis. Um, I'm sure that Dr. Saleh has spoken a lot about the diagnosis and management um, in postmenopausal women in the Gulf uh, region. And this is uh, something that we are really proud of. And I would uh, advise you that you can have a look at uh, this publication uh, from the group. Now, Looking at the HRT, I just want a few things to um, practical things like the transdermal is the one which really advocated as an estrogen formulation versus the oral because of the bypass of the liver and the direct effect on the circulation and doesn't seem to have any major risk of cardiovascular diseases. But if you also wanted to look at the progesterone, it is the micronized uh, progesterone, which is really important uh, that to keep in mind that it is minimally adverse effects on um, uh, the headache, the blood pressure, and the mood, and it doesn't seem to have an increased risk of breast cancer as compared with the, the main uh, medroxy progesterone that was used in the Women Health Initiative study. 
Now, um, other uh, non-hormonal um, alternatives uh, for, for bone, we have the tibolone, which is a synthetic steroid with estrogenic metabolites, uh, and we have the raloxifene. So the tibolone is actually good for the bones with reduction of fracture risk by 50%, but it's actually bad for breast cancer recurrence, as well as bad for the, for the stroke, and it is not FDA approved anyway. Whereas the raloxifene um, is an, a selective estrogen receptor modulator, it, is, uh, it reduces breast cancer risk, but it's bad for the uh, venothrombotic events, which showed to be increased more than 2.7% uh, with increases of the hot flashes. So it's really important to know what is the priority of the woman? Is it the bone health or is it the vasomotor? And then you can work the uh, options accordingly. Um, a few words about the bioidentical hormones. So those are the identical in molecular structure to endogenous hormones are synthesized chemically from uh, yam and from soy and can be compounded. And some of them are actually FDA approved, but they're not FDA regulated. And the uh, position statement from the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists have published the common compound, compounded uh, bioidentical hormone preparations, which are uh, readily available in the market. And, and some women are actually, uh, they prefer that because they think that this is harmless and uh, they're just natural or herbal. And you really need to discuss that with your, uh, with your patient before you can uh, you know, uh, convince her to be of it. Now, a few words about the, uh, the bioidentical uh, hormones. And we think that it is a marketing term. It actually, it lacks purity, potency, and efficacy, and safety measures haven't been really uh, sustained in all studies. And they are exempted from FDA approval because they fall under the dietary supplement uh, health and, and education rather than the mainstream uh, medical uh, uh, tests for, for, uh, for the drugs. And it is definitely not recommended by a majority of the scientific bodies. At the end of the day, I'm going to conclude with the, where I started. Our role here is to enhance knowledge and practices of healthcare providers, as well as our patients. So I would suggest that if you are interested in the topic is to log on to either the British Menopause Society or the uh, North American Menopause Society or the International Menopause Society or the Australian one, or maybe later on we will have some, some society of menopause in the Gulf region. And those societies are really they vary with the amount of information that they provide uh, free of charge and without subscription. <coughs> I personally, um, uh, I mean, feel comfortable with the British Menopause Society because of the, the ease and the, uh, how you know, easy and comprehensive their material uh, is, and you can actually access it without any issue. Um, this is my final slide. I just wanted to conclude with the latest recommendations from the uh, American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists. It was published in 2017, but they are still hold true that the use of menopausal HRT in symptomatic postmenopausal women should be considered. And there all depends on the risk of cardiovascular disease, breast cancer risk, the age and the time of menopause. The transdermal estrogen is less likely to produce any thrombotic or stroke or cardiovascular events. And the uh, progesterone, the micronized progesterone is the safer alternative. The uh, uh, American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists and other uh, bodies, they do not recommend the use of bioidentical hormones. And <coughs> it is really worth noting that they are not recommended for the prevention of diabetes. Some of the published data have uh, commented that the risk of developing diabetes with HRT is less, but then this is not really consistent across all uh, studies. And we cannot say that HRT is a preventative tool uh, from diabetes. At the end of the day, the use of HRT should be individualized, taking into account the metabolic, the cardiovascular risk, and age for all those women. Thank you very much uh, for your attention and I'm happy to take um, any question. Thank you so much.
Thank you very much, Dr. Huda. That was a very extensive uh, review of a very important topic. I think we have exceeded the time <coughs> that we have uh, place for one or two questions. Let me address mm -hmm. one of the questions for Dr. Uh, Yusuf Saleh. Uh, when you decide to stop Rulia, uh, when would you stop it and how would you take measures to stop it? What was, uh, sorry for that, what was the question? Uh, regarding stopping uh, Rulia, when and how? Dunusumab right, so, uh, is not recommended to stop it once you start. And the reason is that when you stop Dunusumab, uh, whenever you stop, if you have a reason, a good reason to stop, um, uh, the rate, the risk of uh, vertebral fractures becomes uh, high, uh, especially in the first six months after you stop. So whenever you stop Dunusumab, you have to give another anti-resorptive, usually alendronate or resedronate if you're in a country that uses that medication. The studies with denosumab um, is up to 10 years and showed progressive increment in uh, densitometry and reduction in both vertebral and non-vertebral fractures, including the hip. Uh, so there is the consensus is to once you start, you continue, you don't stop unless you have a very uh, valid reason to stop it, allergies or whatever, something like that, or financial. Otherwise, you carry on with it. If you have to stop it, you have to shift the patient to another medication. You don't stop and keep the patient without treatment because there are many several reports and case series of increase in vertebral fractures in the period after you stop Dunisimab. Yes. Prof. Dawson, who's with us or she left already? Okay, there's a question for Dr. Riyad Suleimani. Regarding oh. uh, hypocalcemia and ah hi hello, uh, there hello. is a question from the attendees regarding uh, the role of vitamin D in type one diabetes. It's a big topic. Uh, I know you can brief them. Yeah, uh, we know from observational work that uh, it uh, seems to be important, but we do not have the intensive uh, trial evidence for. Uh, any impact. So I think the recommendation would be to have the vitamin D, the same recommendations that you do for other children or uh, age appropriate uh, categories. Thank you. I think we are short so of time. One more question. Yes, oh, yeah. I think okay. for Dr. Huda, Dr. Huda, uh, any role of oxybutyrin, butinine, I mean, in the management of hot flashes? There are few studies here and there, but uh, the results to be often are not consistent. So we cannot really generalize it and they are not, it's not really present in, uh, in guidelines so far. So um, I wouldn't really recommend at this stage. Thank you. Uh, Nadia, I think... Uh, I think we're running short of time also. We have exceeded yeah. our uh, timing. Yes, yeah. Thank Would like to thank all of the speakers. Uh, go ahead, Dr. Nadia. No, no, you, you start. <laughs> no, I would like to thank all of the speakers for those outstanding informative uh, presentation. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Uh, Nadia for uh, co-chairing this uh, session with me. Dr. Thank Nadia. You. Thank you. Thank you and all the best for everybody. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to the session. I'm delighted to be with you this evening, and I'm very, very proud of all of you who are here on a Saturday to learn and share experiences. So welcome to the session. It, Thank you, Dr. Delan. Me Go ahead. Thank you. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker for tonight. We have Dr. Ali al muqbili he is uh, joining us today from Oman. He obtained his medical degree in 1998 at Sultan Qaboos University. He then did internal medicine residency training in Oman and did fellowship in endocrine and diabetes at King Faisal Specialist Hospital in KSA. Uh, disorders of sexual development are one of his areas of interest and he runs a specialized clinic dealing with such cases, which is a great opportunity to discuss the cases we have today. He is the deputy director of the National Diabetes Endocrine Center in Masqat and the program director of Adult Diabetes Fellowship in Oman. 
without further ado, I welcome you, Dr. Ali, to the session, and we will listen to your talk about abnormal sexual development cases. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much, Dr. Dalal, for the nice introduction. Uh, it gives me a great pleasure today to speak about disorders of sex development. And in my talk, I'm going to discuss few cases, give overview of disorders of sex differentiation, and finally, I give a short summary. The focus in today's talk would be on adult cases and on challenges of diagnosis. Our first patient is a 30-year-old female who has primary amenorrhea. She's married since two years and she was started in OCB after Marie, and she got some cycles. But due to infertility, she was evaluated and her LH and FSH are very high. And interestingly, her karyotype was 46XY. Her eldest sister has a similar issue, but never evaluated. Now in examination, she is told no facial dysmorphism and she has completely female phenotype, including well-formed breast and external female genitalia. Her hemoglobin is 13, her potassium is 4.6, and her testosterone is normal for a female reference. Her LH and FSH are high. She has normal cortisol, ACTH, and 17 hydroxyprogesterone. Her karyotype confirmed that she is 46 XY and the SRY gene is positive. The MRI showed hypoblastic uterus and absent bilateral ovaries. So we are dealing with a 46 XY female phenotype, low testosterone, hypoblastic uterus. And the question is, what is the likely diagnosis? Now to answer this question, we need to know little about disorder of sex development, which is a term given to infants born with genitals that do not appear typically male or female or who have an appearance discordant with the chromosomal sex. The old names like intersex, pseudohermatophiles have been replaced by this newer term disorder of sex development. And disorder of sex development are classified into three major categories. Six chromosome disorder of sexual development, 46XY and 46XX DST. Our patient has 46XY DST, so the defect would be one of these. Now the difference between males and females in terms of the sexual organs and characters lies in the in five Gs. This is the simplest I could summarize it. G number one is genome, which contains the chromosomes and the genes, then gonads, genital tracts, genitalia. Genome affects everything. It does affect the gonads, which will affect the genital tracts and might affect the, the genitalia. And the last G is the general appearance which is basically the secondary sexual characters. So patients with DSD would have a problem at one or more of these Gs. As you know, females can have less or more X chromosomes, but males cannot live without X chromosome as 45Y is fatal, but they can have extra X chromosomes now one person can have mixed male and female karyotype. Now these are set of genes required for both males and females, and there are semi-specific genes required for each sex. For example, for 46XY, the SRY gene is needed for testicular development. Now a 46XX female can change to a male phenotype if there is SRY translocation, SOX9 duplication, or RSBO1 mutation. Similarly, the opposite can happen if one of these changes occur. 
Now, early in life, everybody has a biopotential gonad that is going to become testis or ovaries depending on the genes. Early in life, everybody has Mullerian duct and Wolfian duct. One of these ducts is going to progress and the other is going to regress depending in the presence or absence of testis. And these are the derivatives of Wolfian duct and Mullerian duct, abbreviated as three Vs and three Us. Now, in the presence of Y chromosome, which usually has the SRY gene, the undifferentiated gonad is going to differentiate into testis. And the testis would have leading cell that would secrete testosterone for maintaining Wolfian duct structures. And testosterone will be also converted to dihydrotestosterone that is important in viralization of external genitalia. The testis would have Sertoli cells that is going to secrete the malaria inhibitory substance to inhibit the malaria duct development. Now, early in life also, the external genitalia looks the same in both. And at eight to 12 weeks of gestation, viralization can happen depending in the presence or absence of dihydrotestosterone. Now, a 46X, uh, a 46 XY DSD can have a problem in the testis where there is testicular maldevelopment over testicular conditions, dysgenesis, regression. The problem can happen at the biosynthesis of testosterone where one of these enzymes is defective. It can be at the LH receptor or it can be at the LH and GNRH. But usually this happens later, this is a concern later in pregnancy because in the initial phase of pregnancy, the placental CD is the one that drives LH. The problem can be at the level of testosterone conversion to DHT or at the androgen receptors. So a defect at one of these sites might cause a, 40, a, 40, a 46 XY DHT. Now, testis loves the number seven start differentiating at, we, at, at week seven and start descending and the scrotum fuses by 70 days of gestation and the testis is at the, around the inguinal by seven months. And it uses all enzymes containing the number seven for biosynthesis of testosterone in addition to three beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase. Now, this shows you the differential effects of testosterone and dihydrotestosterone in the male internal and external genital structures. Of course, the dihydrotestosterone is important for viralization of the external genitalia as well as development of prostate, while testosterone is important for internal male genitalia development. And these are the additional effects of both hormones. Now, this summarizes the female and male internal and external genitalia and your genital signs. And if you look carefully, the process in females is mostly passive. They need estrogen for further uterus development. Now, case number two, we have a 22-year-old female and at age 14 years, she was noticed by her physician to have some skin protrusion at pubic area. So she was raised as a female and later this was evaluated. She was reassured initially that this is lipoma, re-evaluated again and the karyotype was 46 XY. She decided to convert to male, but after finishing her school. So she presented to us for the process of conversion from female to male at age of 22. Now, an examination, she has some female phenotypes. She has some hair, no breast. And interestingly, she has a scrotum and testis in one side, no scrotum or testis in the other side. She has clitoromegaly or micropenis and blind pouch. She has a male level hemoglobin. Her potassium is 4.5. Her testosterone done twice is high. Her LH and FSH normal. She has normal cortisol, ACTH, and 17 hydroxy. 
Her DHT, which we do it usually outside Oman, as it's not available in our lab, is in the mid-reference range for females. Her karyotype confirmed that she has 46XY karyotype and the SRY gene is positive. The MRI showed an inguinal lesion in the side of the absent testis. Probably this is undescended testis. So we have 46XY, ambiguous genitalia, high testosterone, normal DHT. And what is the likely diagnosis? So this, this fits very well with partial androgen insensitivity syndrome. However, she has no breasts. And that argues against partial androgen insensitivity syndrome. And when we look back at the dihydrotestosterone, remember that the identity of this patient is still female. And for a male reference of DHT, the DHT is low, actually. The testosterone over dihydrotestosterone is 50. So the likely diagnosis is 5-alpha reductase deficiency. And this was proved genetically. So diagnosis of 5-alpha reductase 2 deficiency is supported by normal or high testosterone, testosterone over dihydrotestosterone more than 20, and urinary metabolites. In children and infants, we need SCG stimulation. In adults, we are auto-stimulated. We don't need that. And because measurement of the urinary analyte is difficult and not widely available, a measurement of DHT with immunosays may be unspecific. Genetic confirmation is usually required. The presentation is very interesting. During infancy, this condition might have very mild ambiguity to the degree that it passes unnoticed as what happened in our patients. So we don't blame the parents for not discovering this patient. But during puberty, because of high testosterone and therefore DHT, there will be viralization to various degrees. Now, the isozyme type 2 is de defective while type 1 is normal, and the low but measurable serum concentrations of DHT is due to normal type 1 isozyme and residual activity of the mutant enzyme. And type 1 becomes important during puberty. It's found in non-genital skin, while type 2 is important early in life and expressed in genital skin. And this is the usual pathway for synthesis of THT through isozyme 2. And this is the backdoor pathway for synthesis through isozyme 1, which becomes very prominent when isozyme 2 is blocked. For androgen syndrome in XY, they can be more of male or female phenotype, depending on the degree of insensitivity. But complete androgen sensitivity will have external female phenotype with gynecomastia. And remember that testosterone and dihydrotestosterone bind to the same intracellular androgen receptor. Now, this is a very important clue for adult physicians for such cases. We know that breast development requires some estrogen. It's antagonized by androgen, more correctly by testosterone. So conditions that give us low estrogen, like severe cephantine alpha hydroxylase deficiency, would have no breast development. Conditions also like 5-alpha reductase, where testosterone is high and is functioning, it inhibits breast development. While conditions like androgen syndrome, where testosterone is high, but it's not functioning, the breast development will occur. So why such cases present late and not detected early? These are some of the reasons. Maybe complete phenotype six reversal, mild ambiguity associated conditions like hypertension that usually becomes of concern during adulthood, primary amenorrhea, absence of breast, buberatal induced change of external genitalia and or secondary sexual characters. And in our patient, it is because of these two things. Now, our third patient is a 37-year-old female, difficult to control hypertension and cause features. She is on multiple medications for blood pressure, and she has been having primary amenorrhea 
and she got OCBs, but there was no withdrawal bleeding. So she got referred to us because of coarse features, query acromegaly. And when we examined her, she has coarse features, but no acromegalic features. She is tall, muscular, no breast, and complete external female genitalia. Her biochemistry showed a picture of a primary hyperaldosteronism. Aldosterone is higher in its breast, and a picture mimicking premature ovarian failure. Estradiol is low, LH and FSH are high. Her potassium is in the lower side, 3.6 and she has a normal IGF-1, which is against acromegaly. The karyotype was 466Y, and the SRY gene is present. Interestingly, her cortisol is low, ACTH is high, and she has very high corticosterone. So we are dealing with congenital adrenal hyperplasia, and this is her MRI of the pelvis shows, showing structures in the inguinal area, most likely and descendant. The testis. So what is the likely diagnosis? So to know where is the block, we need to come to this figure. And as you know, the uh, aldosterone synthesis is controlled by the RAS system, while the steroid, other steroid biosynthesis is controlled by ACTH, including the androgens. And these are the different enzymes. And a block at one of these enzymes would give us high precursors, pre-block and low uh, post-block metabolites. And we need to fit our patient in this. Now, in a busy clinic, I usually use this. So I divide into a female genotype, if I'm dealing with a female, or a male genotype, and the numbers three is common for both. 3-beta-hydroxysteroid three three dehydrogenase can cause ambiguity in both males and females, but this is not of a major concern for initial presentation in adulthood because this is usually presents in neonate. Now, for females, it is descending order 3 to 1, 21 alpha hydroxylase and 11-beta-hydroxylase. These are the causes enzyme defects for congenital adrenal hyperplasia causing ambiguity in a female karyotype. And for male, it is 357 ascending order. So these are not strictly the congenital adrenal hyperplasia, but all enzymes with numbers. 5 alpha reductase and 17 alpha hydroxylase, 17 20 lyase, 17 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase. Now, this helps me a lot in my clinic and to narrow the differential diagnosis further, these two conditions would be associated with high blood pressure. Now, our patients, if you look at the metabolites of our patients, it fits with 17 alpha hydroxylase deficiency, and this was proved genetically. Uh, we thank Dr. Ali Zahrani for doing this for us. Now, the, uh, our patient has high aldosterone, and the typical cases will have low aldosterone. And when looking at the literature, there are some cases where you find the aldosterone is normal or high in such cases. And it seems because the block is so severe, the corticosterone is very high and it just diffuses to aldosterone. And there are increasing case reports about this. The presentation of 17 alpha hydroxylase deficiency can be variable in males and females and why such cases are not detected earlier. It's because of these th three things in our patient. The last case is a 48-year-old male. He's married, no kids, one year increasing abdominal swelling with some discomfort. And he underwent CT abdomen, which showed huge mass, 20 centimeters, query malignant lesion, and there are suprarenal which are like adrenal masses, most likely originating from the malignant lesion from the abdomen. In examination, he's short, he has male phenotype. The only abnormality, he has empty scrotai and no testis in the scrotai. And his testosterone is normal, his cortisol is normal, he has also normal beta HCG and alpha-feta protein. So what is the likely diagnosis? 
looking at this patient with undescendant testis, somebody would think of malignancy like gonadoblastoma. He underwent biopsy of the abdominal lesion and it showed benign smooth muscle fibers repeated and it was benign smooth muscle fibers. And strikingly, this is his MRI showing big uterus with fibroid. His labs again, testosterone is normal, 11, estradiol is 227, LHNFSH are suppressed. His ACTH is markedly high, and yet he has normal basal cortisol. There's no increase after synactin. He has very high 17 hydroxyprogesterone as well as androstadione, normal 11 doc. The karyotype was 46XX. So this is congenital adrenal hyperplasia presenting for the first time at age of 48 and it's a bit like a typical presentation. And we're trying to fit this patient in this figure. And this is a, a, a female karyotype, three to one. We usually exclude three, we're remaining with 21 and 11. And this does not fit 100%. So we're trying to look at rare uh, a typical congenital adrenal hyperplasia and also does not fit, but it does fit like 80% in this. So the differential between 21 and 11. So there are a lot of diagnostic challenges in this case, which is beyond the scope of this presentation. There'll be a lot of management challenges also in such a case, which is also beyond the scope of this presentation. We have proven that this patient have 21 hydroxylase deficiency through a genetic study. And this is his uterus and, and adrenals after surgery. He has big uterus and big adrenals around 18 centimeter bilaterally. And so in summary, I spoke about five Gs. The physical examination would help us identify the genitalia and the secondary sexual characters. It might help identifying the gonads. We would require imaging and labs for the gonads and the genital tracts. We always require karyotyping and sometimes specific gene study. DST with atypical genitalia is usually picked up in the neonatal period. DSTs presenting at adulthood are likely to have complete phenotype 6 reversal, mild ambiguity, hypertension, primary amenorrhea, absence of breast, or pubertal induced change of external genitalia and or secondary sexual characters. Atypical genitalia caused by enzyme defect is due to in females 3 to 1 descending order and in males 3, 5, 7. For the proper diagnosis, we need proper history, physical examination, and targeted investigations. There are three diagnostic tools for adult endocrinologists and not for pediatric endocrinologists, the presence or absence of breasts, virilization at puberty, HCG autostimulation. The hormone investigation should be ordered and interpreted in the context of suspected diagnosis and reference ranks according to genotype six, reports of karyotyping and structural images should not suggest only one diagnosis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ali. That was fascinating. And we really enjoyed how you simplified and clearly described these interesting cases. I also thank you for sticking to the time that was perfectly timed. I will move on to our next speaker and then we will do the panel discussion, inshallah. And in the meantime, if I may ask you to stop sharing and for the attendees to kindly put your questions in the Q&A and I'll be happy to direct them to our speakers at the end. Now, our next speaker is Dr. Abdul Majid Al um, Sobehain. He's an assistant professor in Department of Pediatrics, College of Medicine, King Saud University. He's a consultant in pediatric endocrinology and child bone health at the Medical City of the King Saud University. And Dr. Abdul Majid, we welcome you to the session. You may share your slides. We look forward to your talk on hypoparathyroidism.
thank you for the organizing committee uh, for giving me the uh, opportunity to present at uh, such an esteemed uh, uh, Congress of the Gulf Association of Endocrinology and Diabetes. Um, I will talk to you today about hypoparathyroidism, hoping to present an overview of the clinical presentation and treatment strategies. In uh, my uh, presentation, I'll touch on calcium homeostasis, the order and the disorder. Uh, then I'll talk about clinical presentation and diagnosis of hypoparathyroidism. Uh, following this, uh, I'll touch on management goals and end uh, about few bullet points uh, on future directions. Calcium homeostasis, uh, when looked at, reminds us uh, uh, with a busy uh, intersection uh, of traffic. Um, the, the, this is due to the uh, huge amount of influx and efflux of calcium uh, in and out uh, our bodies, which requires order uh, to regulate uh, that calcium traffic without causing any uh, complications to uh, our uh, bodies. If I summarize the um, uh, players of the calcium homeostasis uh, system uh, in one slide, this is how the slide would look like. I apologize if the slide uh, is too busy um, but I can, however, uh, walk you through how uh, this slide was built. So we are going to start with this small, small box and call it the intravascular space. This intravascular space is filled with um, multiple molecules and uh, cations and anions, including the calcium. The calcium is maintained in the intravascular space within uh, a narrow range. This maintenance is made through um, players in the homeostasis system that interact with each other to achieve this. Um, the first player is the parathyroid cell along with its sensing mechanism. To test that sensing mechanism, let's just try to tamper with the calcium level in our intravascular space. So if we push the calcium level down, that will, um, uh, that will turn off the extracellular component of the calcium sensing uh, receptors, which uh, will lead to cessation of the signal uh, intracellularly and the disassembly of the um, uh, proteins downstream, which leads to uh, releasing the brakes on PTH synthesis and PTH release. PTH then departs the parathyroid cell uh, towards it, its um, uh, target tissues. These include the um, uh, PTH1 receptor on the osteoblast cells of the bone, which activates the osteoclasts subsequently, leading to uh, bone turnover um, uh, manipulation uh, in favor of bone resorption. This leads to release of mineral back to the uh, bloodstream from the calcified tissue, the PTH1 receptor at the kidney and the kidney tubule uh, leads then to phosphaturia and uh, reabsorption of calcium back into the system. Further, it activates the 1-alpha hydroxylase enzyme leading to uh, hydroxylation of the 25-hydroxyvitamin D into the 1,25-dehydroxyvitamin D, which departs to the gut and leads to calcium absorption and phosphorus absor absorption with the net results of restoration of our calcium. Now, if we talk about the disorders that occur in the system, then uh, autosomal dominant mutation in the calcium sensing receptor, which leads to um, overactivation of the receptor, uh, and uh, over-sensing of calcium. This leads to a new set point of calcium where uh, the parathyroid cell uh, tends to keep calcium in lower range. Uh, the parathyroid cell is also subject to uh, injury, including surgery, radiation, or uh, hemochromatosis. 
uh, in the pediatric population, uh, we occasionally deal with congenital hypoparathyroidism due to mutations in transcription factors that are important for the um, formation and uh, survival uh, of the parathyroid cell in utero. These include TBX1, of which mutations are known to cause D. George syndrome, CHD7, uh, of which mutations cause CHARGE syndrome, the GATA3 mutations cause uh, HDR, uh, the TBCE mutations cause Sanjotsakati and Kinney Cafe syndrome, um, mitochondrial DNA alterations causing mitochondrial disease. This is also known to affect the parathyroid cells uh, in uh, kern sire syndrome and Milas syndrome. Um, mutations in the, in the PTH molecule itself cause auto, autosomal dominant and autosomal recessive hypoparathyroidism. Autoimmunity against the parathyroid cell or um, antibodies against against the calcium sensing receptors leading to activations are known to, uh, in, in patients with APS uh, type 1. Also not to forget about magnesium as both hypermagnesemia uh, or uh, hypomagnesemia uh, are known uh, to alter the function of the parathyroid cell, uh, which may lead to hypoparathyroidism. Now, in terms of clinical presentations, uh, these differed according to age groups, for example, in newborns and infants. Um, these these um, individuals usually present with incidental biochemical finding, um, but most occasionally uh, seizures is the, is the presenting symptoms. Titany, recurrent striders, and delayed motor milestones are also presentations of hypoparathyroidism in this age group. Uh, when children are, are older, uh, enough to, um, uh, when children are old enough to express the, um, the uh, neuromuscular uh, signs and symptoms associated with hypoparathyroidism, they start complaining about tetany and tingling, muscle cramps, and they are noticed to be fatigued. They also may present with seizures. Uh, in adolescents and adults, uh, they usually present with tetany, tingling, muscle cramps, and fatigues. Some of the adults may be uh, discovered to have hypoparathyroidism uh, or hypocalcemia through uh, a workup of, of uh, palpitations or chest pain, where ECG uh, shows findings that are in keeping with hypocalcemia. Um, there is also this description of the brain fog feeling, or which leads to decreased uh, quality of life in these individuals. Hypocalcemia or hypoparathyroidism is a multi-systemic disease. Um, these systems are either affected by hypocalcemia itself or by the lack of parathyroid hormone uh, effects on peripheral tissues. Uh, also, these tissues are perhaps affected by the conventional therapy that we administer to, to these uh, individuals. So uh, there are certain associations with hypoparathyroidism uh, that the clinician should be aware of, especially um, uh, clinicians who uh, practice uh, in the pediatric field. So I try to, to make these associations in triads to make them easy to remember. So in a, in a child or infant with congenital cardiac or aortic anomalies, cleft palate or palatopharyngeal insufficiency, and learning disabilities with hypoparathyroidism, D. George syndrome should be thought of. Uh, the infant or child with growth retardation, microcephaly, and global developmental delay, and hypoparathyroidism. This is usually seen in Sanjat Sakati syndrome. The child with sensory neural, sensory neural hearing loss, renal agenesis, and uterine anomalies, a female. Uh, this is usually seen in HDR, also known as Barakat syndrome. The child with coloboma, cardiac anomalies, growth retardation, and hypoparathyroidism. This is in keeping with CHARGE syndrome, uh, recurrent fungal infections of the mucocutaneous membranes, onycholysis, and alopecia, 
This is usually seen in autoimmune cholendocrinopathy syndrome type 1. Uh, in terms of the diagnostic criteria, they, they, these uh, were devised by the consistency, consensus statement and the uh, guidelines by Endocrine Society published in 2016. So they suggest hypocalcemia, uh, that is albumin corrected in two different occasions separated by two weeks, undetectable or inappropriately low PTH measured by second or third generation immunoassays, phosphate level in the upper normal or frankly elevated, uh, helpful but not mandatory criterion. In terms of management goals, uh, the first uh, step in after identifying these individuals is to establish a multidisciplinary team. Uh, this team should in include, of course, an endocrinologist, a nephrologist, clinical dietitian, an ophthalmologist, audiologist, neurologist, psychologist, psychiatrist, and a physiotherapist, and perhaps more uh, uh, specialties uh, if the clinical situation uh, requires so. The second goal is to achieve near normal calcium level. Uh, this is uh, achieved through optimizing dietary calcium and vitamin D intake uh, so these patients should be uh, constantly reviewed by uh, clinical dietitians. Uh, the second strategy to achieve this is uh, through the use of calcium salts. Um, in uh, our region, we, we have calcium carbonate and calcium globulinate uh, available uh, as syrups that, that are suitable for children and infants. Um, calcium carbonate is also available in uh, chewable tabs or, or, or tabs that are suitable uh, for adults. The third strategy to achieve this is the, through the use of active vitamin D, calcidiol or calcitriol. Uh, calcitriol is unfortunately available in uh, capsules only, so it is uh, not suitable for the use in infants or little children. Instead, calcidiol, which is uh, available as oral drops, uh, is used. Another goal is to achieve normal range phosphate levels. Now, the strategies that help the clinician to achieve this is through optimizing calcium and active vitamin D uh, doses. Uh, calcium salts bind phosphorus, so they they can hit two birds with one stone, uh, correcting the calcium level and reducing the uh, phosphate levels uh, in the serum. Active vitamin D doses should be optimized uh, just enough to facilitate calcium absorption, uh, but high doses should be avoided uh, as these would also facilitate uh, phosphor phosphorus absorption through the gut. Uh, diet modifications might uh, be required in, in patients with uh, difficulties to achieve normal phosphate levels. Uh, this is done through a reduction of phosphorus intake in the diet. Uh, and uh, one of the uh, strategies to control uh, phosphate uh, levels in the serum is through the use of phosphate binders. And this is uh, usually resorted to in patients with uh, difficulties to achieve normal phosphate. Uh, another goal is to minimize hypercalciuria. Uh, this is required to preserve uh, the renal functions and to avoid uh, the formation of uh, renal stones. And this is again through optimizing calcium and active vitamin D uh, through achieving uh, uh, near normal calcium level and avoiding normal or high calcium um, uh, serum levels. Low salt diet uh, in combination of hydrochlorothiazide is another strategy to minimize hypercalciuria. Hydrochlorothiazide is, however, contraindicated for uh, in, in individuals with hypoparathyroidism associated with Barter syndrome or tubulopathies. 
In regards to monitoring and follow-up, so all of these individuals should be seen every three to six months uh, with, uh, uh, in uh, a, a practice uh, that is experienced in uh, the management of uh, hypoparathyroidism. Uh, in each visit, uh, calcium, phosphate, magnesium, BUN, and creatinine, EGFR uh, should be assessed and done uh, uh, as frequently as uh, the uh, clinical situation requires 24-hour urine for calcium creatinine ratio uh, as clinically indicated. In children, we tend to uh, screen uh, hypercalciuria uh, by checking the spot urine calcium creatinine ratio on every visit. Uh, renal ultrasound uh, is recommended yearly or every two years in these individuals to screen for uh, nephrocalcinosis. Uh, brain CT scans and eye, eye exams are uh, indicated uh, whenever there is concern about um, the uh, function uh, of the basal ganglia as these are prone for, to calcifications in these conditions. Eye exams are also in, indicated uh, for uh, screening of the associated complications such as uh, cataract and papilledema. Um, in, in terms of the management strategies that we have spoken about thus far, uh, these all uh, are uh, labeled as the conventional therapy. Now, there, there has been issues about the con conventional therapy in uh, the treatment of uh, hypoparathyroidism. These issues include the fact that this strategy does not correct the fundamental disorder of the condition, which is the PTH deficiency. Uh, further, hypercalciuria and decreased phosphorus clearance continue to be an issue because of the uh, lack of uh, PTH in the system. The bone turnover is known to be lower than uh, uh, individuals with PTH uh, sufficiency, which leads to increased bone density uh, and perhaps uh, increased uh, risk of fractures due to the ability uh, of the uh, calcified tissues to achieve good uh, modeling and remodeling. Uh, the quality of life continues to be decreased in these individuals despite conventional therapy and, and more a, a, a good number of these individuals describe the feeling of the brain fog, which really impact their uh, quality of life. Uh, the burden to medical care systems continue to be a cancer as these individuals require uh, multiple visits to the hospital, multiple, multiple biochemical uh, testing, and, and to add to the mix children that we follow up with hypoparathyroidism have variable calcium levels, and they tend to uh, require multiple hospitalization as their calcium uh, levels tend to uh, plummet each time the, the child catches a virus or has uh, a, a, gas, uh, a, a bout of gastroenteritis. Um, and, and this, of course, adds to uh, the um, quality of life compromise of these children and families. To overcome these issues, nowadays, um, the uh, era of uh, PTH um, analogs have, uh, has, has come to us. So there are two uh, PTH analogs that are known uh, or being used in, in uh, patients. The first analog is the recombinant PTH uh, that contains the uh, first 34 uh, amino acids from the uh, N terminus. This is called Forteo. This is FDA approved for osteoporosis in adults. The use in hypoparathyroidism remains off label. Uh, there has been a concern that the use of recombinant PTH in humans might increase the risk of uh, osteosarcoma in individuals with, with, um, uh, open growth plates in individuals in, uh, in, with, with a skeleton that continues to grow. 
this is based on um, uh, studies done on rodents who receive uh, three, more than three times of the usual dose that is given to human because of this theoretical uh, risk, uh, the, the black box warning uh, continues uh, to, to be uh, an issue. Uh, the black box warning of osteosarcoma was however removed from the Forteo uh, product. On the other hand, the complete a molecule of recombinant PTH, uh, the, the molecule, the 1 to 84 um, amino acid uh, molecule uh, is, is another option. Um, uh, the, 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 the other molecule uh, is FDA approved for hypoparathyroidism in adults if conventional therapy has failed. Uh, it continues to bear the black box warning or the osteo of the osteosarcoma. This is uh, the, a landmark randomized controlled trial uh, to show the efficacy of uh, the uh, 1 to 84 uh, recombinant human parathyroid uh, hormone, or uh, no, also known as NATPARA. Uh, the, 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 the trial is called the REPLACE trial. It involved uh, 134 individuals from uh, eight uh, different uh, countries. Uh, these individuals uh, were randomized to receive one daily injections of uh, recombinant parathyroid hormone uh, with a placebo. Uh, the, the, the both arms continues to receive conventional therapy with end point was to reduce um, conventional therapy doses but more than 50% with maintenance of calcium level to levels uh, comparable to baseline or slightly above, but not above the normal range of calcium. And the study has shown success uh, of reaching the primary endpoint in nearly um, 53% uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, at the end of the study, which, which is 24 weeks, with uh, a safety profile uh, that did not differ from from uh, uh, the active uh, group and the placebo group. Uh, in terms of future direction, so these uh, interventions, I mean, the use of recombinant um, a human parathyroid hormone uh, should fall within protocols that are optimized to um, deal with uh, long-term complications. So more studies are required uh, in, in that regard. Establishing safety and, tolerab and tolerability of PTH analogs in, in children uh, is still required. There are few studies that looked at uh, the, the use of PTH analogs in children. Um, however, large studies to establish the safety are required. Um, we are looking also into uh, other delivery methods that may come in the future of uh, PTH analogs, for example, there, are, there, there, there is a study or two that looked into the continuous subcutaneous infusion pumps in uh, delivering PTH. There might be other uh, modes of delivery of PTH, uh, like the, the, the oral route or the intranasal route that we might hear about in the future to improve the uh, quality of life in, in these individuals. I'd like to thank you now, uh, and I'm happy to uh, hear any comments or questions. Thank you, Dr. Abdel Majid. That was an outstanding talk. And um, perhaps I forgot to introduce myself at the beginning. My name is uh, Dalala Rumehi. I'm a consultant adult endocrinologist from King Hamad University at Bahrain, and I'm an associate professor at the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. So if I may again ask all our participants, please, if they have any questions to our outstanding speakers to put them in the chat box or the Q&A, and I'll be happy to ask on your behalf. We had very interesting concepts. I learned a lot myself. There are questions already in the Q&A, but perhaps I'll start from a question from myself. Um, if we start with you, Dr. Ali. Uh, I'm, you're, I'm listening to your cases, and I'm wondering how busy is your clinic 
what are the types of referrals that you get so that our audience know when to refer patients for evaluation? Is it mainly amenorrhea? When should we refer? Actually, uh, we tend to have cluster of cases. For example, like the last year, we have a cluster of cases. They are uncommon, actually, but uh, uh, the the issue here is that if these patients have complete six reversal, they will pass unnoticed until a later stage. Um, now, uh, my clinic uh, is introduced uh, uh, recently, and the aim of it is to gather these cases. So uh, any patient fitting in disorder sexual development, we do receive uh, him or her in our clinic, and we are expanding it to a multidisciplinary clinic involving psychiatrists and other uh, specialized uh, uh, physicians. That's a great resource to have for referrals. Um, for Dr. Abdel Majid, if I may ask you about the target vitamin D we should try to achieve in these patients. Is it different than the general population? And some physicians stop the vitamin D because the patient is on active vitamin D. If you could elaborate on that, please. Uh, thank you, Professor Dalal, for uh, uh, this question. Yes, so uh, the, the uh, target of 25 hydroxyvitamin D uh, in, in this population has not been really discussed uh, very well in the literature. Now, uh, some some may say, well, since they are on active vitamin D, then uh, what's what's the point of of giving them the uh, or filling their stores with with the 25 hydroxy vitamin D? Uh, now I'm not sure about the answer because there might be physiological effects of 25 hydroxy vitamin D that we are not aware of. So I tend to monitor 25 hydroxy vitamin D in these children, at least from, my, from, from the population uh, that, that I, I serve, and, and try to achieve a, a normal range, um, uh, by 25 hydroxy vitamin D. And I have to say that I, I cannot uh, back myself up with good evidence for this. Thank you so much, because we do notice if the vitamin D is not sufficient, you chase calcium harder. There must be a value of having both the active and uh, the 25 hydroxy vitamin D. There's a question from Dr. Asmadeep for you, Dr. Ali, if I may read it from the Q&A. She says, great talk. Uh, in your experience of 17 hydroxylase deficiency, does hydrocortisone replacement control blood pressure or they would still need to add antihypertensives? Uh, great question. Uh, we have few cases of 17 alpha hydroxylase, and because uh, this has been long standing and controlled uh, blood pressure, uh, most of uh, almost all of our patients require additional one or two uh, antihypertensive treatments like spinal lactone and others. So it is not enough, usually. Yeah. And you think you attribute that to the chronicity of their hypertension leading to some yes. damage? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. And then there's a question for you, Dr. Abdul Majid, if I may. Um, for how long can we use Forteo in patients with hypoparathyroidism who are not controlled with conventional treatment if we do not have available 184 RPTH? Uh, yeah, so in that regard, I'm, I'm afraid that I don't have or I haven't come across any, any data that looked at uh, long-term safety. Uh, I have come across a study that looked at eight-year uh, uh, outcomes uh, on, on NATPARA, the uh, 1 to 84 uh, amino acid uh, recombinant PTH. Uh, so one may, one may argue that they, they are almost the same, but um, I, I can't be sure. Especially with pediatrics and their growth plates are open, so we don't know the long-term data. Exactly, so in, in pediatrics, we seldom use uh, these products. Uh, in, my, in my career, I only saw uh, two children 
group uh, A of product one uh, was with uh, APS type one who who uh, failed uh, conventional therapy and and responded very well on on Forteo and that that child was uh, an adolescent and used it for almost three years and she was happy on it. Uh, the problem is that it 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 in in in, 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 in that child required. Uh, sometimes up to three injections per day in order to maintain uh, good calcium levels. Uh, the other child was a child with Sanjit Sakati syndrome who uh, who required two injections per day in order to uh, maintain calcium levels. Unlike the NATPARA study, the replay study, where, where more than half of the uh, active arm uh, individuals were able to achieve um, the, the, the good good uh, calcium uh, levels with only one uh, injection per day. That's fascinating. And Dr. Ali, there's a question. I think they want us to reflect back on case number three. I think that's your 37-year-old female with secondary hypertension. Uh, the question is, why aldosterone went up in that case? Is that the case of the high corticosterone? If you can elaborate for our attendees. Yes, so uh, that's a great question. I, uh, I threw some light on this. So usually the, uh, the precursors will inhibit renin and therefore the aldosterone becomes slow. And in our case, the aldosterone is high. And it seems if the block is so severe, you have a lot of metabolized pre-block and it just diffuses to aldosterone. That's the only explanation. And there are uh, a lot of case reports highlighting this, especially from the Gabonese group. Thank you. And if I ask you again, Dr. Abdul Majid, about the outcome of therapy, that was very important. So it's not just biochemical improvement, but we want to see hardcore outcomes. So for children, what is expected for their uh, bone health? What is expected for their growth development, their stature? Yeah, yeah, you, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, results are what clinical trials publish and, and outcomes is what, what makes it to the news. So uh, unfortunately in children, there aren't sufficient studies that, that looks at the, how, how children uh, change or how their quality of life change while on uh, PTH. And it's, it's because that there is a concern, a big concern of using recombinant PTH in children due to the black box warning. Now in adults, um, well, I think there should be studies looking at uh, rate of calcification in the basal ganglia, basal ganglia function uh, over a long uh, term of follow-up, renal function over long term of follow-up, cost effectiveness and burden to medical uh, healthcare systems. Now, w one thing that, that has been looked at is, is the brain fog uh, feeling that, that most of adults express when, when they are uh, suffering from, from hypopara. And, and, and this feeling has been uh, significantly reduced uh, in, in uh, individuals who took the uh, recombinant um, uh, parathyroid hormone. Uh, they also improved in, in uh, uh, quality of life scores. So that, that is very encouraging. And we hope to see this in children soon. Absolutely. And Dr. Ali, uh, I must ask this question. I know you said it's outside the scope, but what to tell them, how do, to deal with them? I think it's almost as challenging as finding the right gene and the right diagnosis and what pathway went wrong. And we discuss this sometimes, or I, I see chat uh, discussions in the uh, uh, endocrinologists group saying what to do in the Gulf. How do we deal with it religiously, socially, legally? And we shy away from it. We withdraw from it as clinicians, but patient rights are there and we have to be there to support them. So what are your comments on that? Maybe Dr. Abdul Majid will also comment on this issue. Yes. So uh, this is really very difficult. And uh, I think two or three of uh, the cases I presented, they are already married. Uh, and it's very difficult at this point to disclose the, 
the, the condition and what to do with the uh, wife or the husband, do you disclose to them? Uh, is the marig like religiously fine? Should they get divorced? There are a lot of questions. And uh, what we do, we do it in like uh, a graded sessions and we involve a multidisciplinary team, uh, including the psychologist, psychiatrist, uh, uh, and uh, we have also DST committee and ethical committee in our hospital. And we are in contact with the religious uh, people. So we involve all of them in the decision before disclosing anything. And luckily things went fine uh, to the degree that was not expected. We still have like two or three cases who are already married for several years. And uh, we just discovered them now. And now we are struggling how to disclose the issues. Uh, it has to be very careful. And it should be tailored to our tradition, to our uh, like religion and beliefs. Uh, uh, and this might need like a full uh, session and discussion and there will be no consensus, uh, but we, we do it for uh, the favor of our like uh, uh, culture and religion usually, yeah. Yeah, thank you for ra raising this point, uh, Professor Dalal. I do, I do agree that uh, this area is still part of uh, a, a taboo that that doesn't really get touched uh, when it, when it comes to our societies. Um, now, it is it is very sensitive to the, to the extent that when when I see a child with with uh, the classical twenty one hydroxylase, that child be, be a female in her regular follow up. When I ask uh, about the gender roles and the, the parents get get a little bit uh, upset. Um, so I, I totally agree with with uh, Dr. Ali and and um, uh, usually they say uh, approach to to chronic illnesses is through the biopsychosocial structure. But in our society, I would add the biopsycho religious social structure in 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 such in such uh, presentations um i have to point out the suffering does not or or the psychological um, burden does not begin a diagnosis these individuals uh, if you if you look back they are in in uh, in in uh, a limbo and and uh, they are usually confused because most of them they have uh, gender roles that are not in keeping with their internal feeling for their entire life until a smart physician like Dr. Ali comes and say, "Well, we figured out what, what's wrong with you." So, so the, the the story doesn't doesn't actually begin at diagnosis. The story starts from long before diagnosis. Totally agree. Well, this gives me it gives me an opportunity to call upon GAED as a society to put together some kind of guidance, some kind of committee over the region. We are so common among, whether it's Oman, Saudi, Bahrain, Kuwait, Qatar, uh, UAE, we can put something together, maybe follow the same model that's for diabetes in Ramadan, which has chapters and different things and religious and legal. Uh, luckily, this is less common, but it's more significantly important in religious and social aspects that maybe GAED can lead a path towards a, a start of a guideline or a start of a um, consensus, maybe. Totally and, agree, yeah. And I think with that, we will conclude the session to stay on time. That was a fascinating discussion and great talks. I really learned a lot and enjoyed it. Thank you so much. And I'm sure our participants appreciate it as well. Thank you and have a great evening.